Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Greer Klein. My pronouns are she, her, and I'll be your host for today, our final day of St. Vera Connect 2021. Uh, we're so happy you're joining us for this final day. We've got some great presentations, a bunch of great lightning talks, and our keynote address. So I just want to get us started with some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar has live closed captioning available. The conference is being recorded. We'll have videos available on the Sanvera YouTube channel and slides will be made available in the Sanvera community repository and attendees will receive links to both in the days after the conference. Uh, we have the Q&A function for your questions. We have a Connect Slack channel available for conversation. And if you need access to the Samvera Slack workspace, there's a link on SCED where you can request access. And today's sessions will run for three and a half hours and we'll have two 10 minute breaks. So in the interest of maintaining a safe and supportive environment for all Samverans participating in today's events, we will read the code of conduct and anti-harassment policy at the start of each day as a gentle reminder of how we work together and care for one another. Sanvera's code of conduct lays out our shared expectations for respectful communication. The Sanvera community is dedicated to providing, <clears throat> excuse me, a welcoming and positive experience for all its members, whether they're at a formal gathering, in a social setting, or taking part in activities online. The Sanvera community welcomes participation from people all over the world, and these community members bring with them a wide variety of professional, personal, and social backgrounds. Whatever these may be, we treat colleagues with dignity and, and respect. Community members communicate primarily in English, though for many of them, this is not their first language. We therefore strive to express ourselves simply and remember that unnecessary use of jargon and slang will be a barrier to understanding for many of our colleagues. We are sensitive to the fact that the international nature of the community means that we span many different social norms around language and behavior, and we strive to conduct ourselves online and in person in ways that are unlikely to cause offense. Severe conversations are often information rich and intended to generate discussion and debate. We discuss ideas from a standpoint of mutual respect and reasoned argument. The companion piece to the code of conduct is Samvera's anti-harassment policy and it reads as follows. The Samvera community does not tolerate harassment in any form. Sexual or discriminatory language and imagery is not appropriate for any event venue, including talks or any community channel, such as Slack-based chat rooms or mailing lists. Harassment includes offensive verbal comments related to sex, gender, ethnicity, nationality, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, age, race, or religion, sexual or discriminatory images in public spaces, deliberate intimidation, stalking, harassing photography, sustained disruption of talks or other events, inappropriate physical contact, and unwelcome sexual attention. Participants asked to stop any harassing behavior are expected to comply immediately. We expect participants to follow the code of conduct and anti-harassment policy at all meeting venues, meeting related social events, community gatherings, and online communication channels. Participants violating the code of conduct or anti-harassment policy may be sanctioned or expelled at the discretion of the incident response team in accordance with the Severa Code of Conduct Incident Response Manual. So if you're new to the community, there's probably a lot going on that might seem unfamiliar or unclear, and it's okay to feel a little lost or out of place because most of us did it first. Many of us have found the best way to get over our initial discomfort is to jump in by asking questions or volunteering to help. We're an agile community working to make things better as we go, and that means everyone is qualified to help, and there's no imposters here. Most of all, we want everyone to have fun, learn new things, and help move Samvera forward. And with that, I am very happy to be able to introduce our keynote speaker. So Dr. Amar Jean Christian is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northwestern University. 
His research focuses on the political economy of legacy and new media, cultural studies, and community-based research. He pub published his first book, Open TV, Innovation Beyond Hollywood and the Rise of Web Television, on New York University Press in 2018, and is currently writing his second book, Open Systems, which explores how to repair systemic harm and discrimination in media, technology, and research. His scholarship has been published in numerous academic journals, including the International Journal of Communication, Television and New Media, Social Media and Society, Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, among other journals and edited collections. Dr. Christian engages industry and community-based organizations as part of his research. He's given lectures for and collaborated with the Sundance Institute, Vimeo, the SAG-AFTRA Foundation, Black Public Media, and more. He has jur juried television and video for the Peabody Awards, Gotham Awards, and the Tribeca Film Festival, among others. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Christian. I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sambera, Heather, and Carolyn for inviting me. Um, I am really honored to be here. I'm really honored that you are here on Zoom uh, listening to me talk. Um, a lot of us have been on Zoom for now well over a year, for hours and hours a day. It's very hard to get me to show up to a Zoom conference. Um, so the fact that there are 60 people in this room um, is wonderful and it really makes me excited. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about something that's really new to me. Um, this is not a lecture I've given before, it's just completely new. Um, and I'm calling it digital archiving in process as a reparative practice. Um, my next book is looking at reparative practice in media technology and research using the case study of OTV that I'll be doing today. And that case study is really speaking to those fields um, or industries, uh, media, mostly via Hollywood and television, technology, mostly via social media companies and research itself through universities. Um, today, I'll be talking about something that's a little bit aside of the project, but is maybe the next phase or one of the next phases. There's multiple next phases to this project. Um, but I did want to start by just saying that, <clears throat> you know, I'm not an archivist by training. I'm, I don't have training in library science or information studies. I do read information studies and read about archiving as part of my broader reading, um, but this is not my expert area. I'm rather someone who found themselves archiving um, without necessarily recognizing that that's what I was doing. Um, and the management of information has, the more I've done the work, increasingly become kind of a pressing issue that I've realized I need to start fundraising for. Um, so it was just last year that I started writing for my first grants for um, digital archiving. So this is very much a new um, area for me. I found myself um, initially confronted with the challenges of digital archiving during the early years of researching research for my book. Um, my book is on what some people call web series, what I call independent television. This, these are television series that are produced and distributed independent of the Hollywood system via the internet because the internet is an open distribution platform and allows producers to distribute their TV shows without having to go to ABC, HBO, or Netflix eventually um, to distribute their shows. When I was trying to figure out what the historical context was for this, because I was started studying this in the mid 2000s, right around the time that YouTube um, was became available to the general public and streaming started to become a thing, um, a popular uh, activity. Um, I realized going through LexisNexis, going through trade publications, that there were ver versions of web series that had dated back to the 1990s. And in fact, the first web series had sold to NBC in 1996, a series called The Spot, which you see pictured on the left of this, um, uh, these screen captures from the Internet Archive or the Wayback Machine. Um, I realized doing my research that The Spot wasn't the only show. There were actually dozens of kind of independent television shows that were mostly text and photo based with minimal video because this was dial up, of, obviously, and video was very hard to download. Um, and I noticed that there were tons of holes and gaps in the archive, right? We can see here on the upper left, um, there's an image from the spot 
which is just not visible. And while I was able to get some decent screenshots, as you can see here, of the spot over here and of this series, uh, Gay Days, over here, um, these were pretty rare. I mean, if I look in my folder, there's really not much I was able to actually pull. Most of these series, because they were independent, because they were small scale, they weren't um, working with corporations that were consistently storing their data, uh, there's a lot of this history that is lost, even though um, you know digital technologies can hold lots of information, that information has to be carefully processed, right? And so this was the beginning of my understanding that digital technology, digital archiving is not um, any better necessarily, right, than physical archiving. Um, and so I will come to how I'm thinking about this in a much more robust way, but I do wanna talk a little bit about the kinds of people I'm now working with. So through my current community-based work, I work with so-called intersectional artists or communities. These are artists who come from multiple communities that have been historically marginalized across fields and contexts, right? Um, intersectionality is a black feminist theory meant designed to describe how black women live at the intersection of race and gender and face a specific form of marginalization because of the ways in which those two identity categories manifest, right? Um, they face racism and sexism, and then a unique form of racism and sexism, which Moy Bailey, who just joined us in comm studies, calls misogynoir. Um, we see this kind of form of marginalization in archives themselves. Um, these kinds of slippages and invisibilities in archives is not unfamiliar to people in my communities. I was really inspired um, by the author C. Riley Snorton, um, who in his book, Black on Both Sides, tries to write a racial history of trans identity, understanding that trans people, A, the term trans is relatively modern and so doesn't necessarily exist throughout history. And also um, because of gender marginalization, trans people have been marginalized in archives in a range of ways. Um, <clears throat> K.R. K.J. Rawson in the inaugural issue of Transgender Studies Quarterly writes, transgender phenomenon proved quite challenging to the archive. The very site of transgender experience, the body, cannot be captured by historical fragments collected in an archive because of the irreducible distance between historical objects and the lives they come to represent. As a result of archival memory separation from the quote source of knowledge, from the knower, the archive fails to capture much embodied and ephemeral memory. And indeed, that is what I have found is the possibility of what I'm calling archiving in practice, which I will talk, is that possibility to capture embodied and ephemeral memory, which are essential to identities whose, that are complex, right, and that are not historically represented. Um, I must say that Riley finds some possibility in these slippages. Um, and notes that race to ruptures archives in addition to trans identity. Riley drawing, drawing from Tavi Nwango says that race is a theory of history and counters that race is a history of theory that functions to express what is thinkable or unthinkable across complex temporalities. He writes, in each formulation, history becomes less a program for examining change over time and more an examination of disruptions in linear time, right? Riley here finds possibility in disruption. Um, drawing from L.H. Stallings, he writes, uh, well, Stallings writes, if transgender and transsexual history and culture depend on what has been published, visible, legible, and authorized enough to be archived, then we might query what has been omitted as a result of the conditions of illiteracy, criminalization, and poverty, right? In this book, Riley finds trans history in criminal records, right, in legal records, which is a kind of now common practice within queer, queer archiving and queer history. Storton instead embarks on a, quote, combination of foraging and disfiguration with an attentive to, attentiveness to interstitial spaces in the archives to continue an ongoing investigation of racialized gender. He asks, what can image reveal about the histories of blackness, transness, and sexual cultures, about their indefinities and irreducibilities, about their temporalities of emergence? I might add for this talk, what might it mean to find answers to these questions, not in interstitial spaces, but in the abundance that digital art technologies afford? And I think that I'm not the only one thinking about this. I think there's a lot of scholars um, and 
independent archivists who believe that the digital might be able to actually fill in those interstitial um, pieces such that we can actually discover these histories, remember these histories in some of the fullness in which they were actually lived. I'm pointing to um, my colleague at Temple, Adrian Shaw's LGBTQ plus video game archive um, and the digital transgender archive as just two instances of looking back to history and using the digital to start collecting some of that richness and in information. Of course, digital archiving has its own inefficiencies and its flexibility presents an opportunity to queer the archive. Trevor Owens, writing about digital preservation generally, says that digital preservation is a craft, not a science. Um, the history of computing is best primarily understood as a social and cultural phenomenon instead of a technical one. Rhetorically, computing is sold to us as clean, efficient, and near, nearly perfect logistical, logical mechanisms. However, experience teaches us that computers are very much a part of the misses we know so well from our analog world. Um, it drives fail, right? Bits flip, files corrupt, as I showed earlier. Craft is essential here because it is an ongoing, unresolved dialogue between preservation professions and, quote, must be responsive to the inherent messiness and historically contingent nature of the logics of computing, right? So we hear, see here that both digital archiving could potentially expand who can do archiving, um, and that data has a social life. I'm drawing there from David Beer and Roger Burroughs, and that this social life is integral to the process of digital archiving to attend to those um, bits flipping, files corrupting, right? Um, the uh, uncleanliness of this digital form of archiving. So what's missing in the messiness and contingent nature of this social life, I would argue is intersectionality. And so a focus on intersectionality with digital archiving pre presents a really unique opportunity to explore the possibilities of this craft, as Owen says. He writes, there are no quote, universal solutions, which is a tenant of intersectionality, rather crafting the right approach for a given preservation context, right? The need for specificity, um, the need for attending to the social complexities, right? Of the work that you are contending with. So where do I enter in on this terrain of the in a, an unequal archive on one end and the slippages of digital archives on the other. Um, this became apparent to me that I was archiving and that maybe I wasn't thinking about it as robustly when I had a meeting with Jacqueline Stewart, who is now, I believe, the artistic director of the Museum for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, known for the Oscars, um, a professor at the University of Chicago and recent MacArthur Genius Grant winner, I believe. We had coffee and she told me that um, when I was describing my process of working with artists to make intersectional video here in Chicago and distribute it, she told me I was archiving. <laughs> um, and she asked me about my process and I was, um, unfortunately, I didn't have great answers. And I felt very called out um, by that question because I realized that there was historical significance to what I was doing when I was hyper-focused at the time, this was a couple of years ago, um, on the present. Jacqueline Stewart is very aware of the archives. She studies historical cinema. Um, her book, uh, most of her books are in Black, the history of Black independent cinema, um, which tends to be quite fractured. And she is one of the founders of the Southside Home Movies Project here in Chicago, where she archives um, home movies from the South Side of Chicago, understanding that the everyday people's representations of their neighbors, off neighborhoods also matter. And of course she's from the South side, so she has a personal investment in this. Um, I noticed through Jackie Stewart that I was performing an archive um, through the, my work at OTV. Um, and I was realizing the power of understanding history and the contemporary reality of inequality and marginalization and the importance of archiving that while my participants were alive to assist in that process. And that notion of them being alive is very pressing because we have lost artists, um, even though most of them are very young already in the, many, in the five years that we have been doing this work. I also noticed the power in understanding the everyday lives of marginalized people as it relates to the sensationalized representations we see of us on TV. We're in a moment right now where Hollywood is newly discovering the power of intersectionality. We have Pose, the first show starring Black trans people. We have Random Acts of Flyness on HBO, an experimental show about the multiplicity of the Black experience. We have Pentified and 
Um, a number of other shows foregrounding working class Latinx communities, Vida, right, which is a queer Latinx show on stars, beautiful show, Pea Valley. There's all these stories that have never been told and they're wonderful, but they're also still corporatized, right? They're made for marketing. And the stories that I release, you will see the stories that I've cultivated here in collaboration with artists in Chicago are much more down home. There's simply not the budget to create that kind of razzmatazz. And so you end up getting snapshots of what life is like in this present time for people whose lives, whose everyday lives are considered kind of too boring, right? for Hollywood. Um, so I'm wondering, the question I'm going to be posing throughout this talk is, can this process repair the slippages in future archives? Are we actually um, in OTV correcting some of the archival problems that the future generations might have? That's a very open question. I, I, I really don't know. Um, history tells me to be highly skeptical. Um, but I also remain temperamentally hopeful. So, you know, this is just a snapshot of what I'm talking about, um, which is a platform called OTV Open Television. We're a platform for intersectional television, and we assist artists who have been historically marginalized by their race, gender, sexuality, disability, religion, citizenship status, um, and other forms of identity marginalization in telling their stories. Practically, this looks like a mutual a reciprocal relationship between researcher and subject where um, in order to start the research process, I first ask an artist, what is the story they want to tell and why? And then I offer advice as to how they might begin the process of developing and producing that story based on my research and over, over the years, based on the real life connections I've made to other people in this city who want to help make this world, this work reimagined. We then, um, once the stories are fundraised for and produced, which is a whole process, um, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit in this talk, and the work is made, we then release it on the OTV distribution app, which is available on most connected TV devices and mobile devices. Um, and then after the story is released, I meet with the artists again and I ask them, how was that process for you? What did you learn? What kinds of innovations did you discover? What kinds of conflicts and harms did you in uh, encounter and how is OTV supportive or not in that process. That's a way to keep the platform accountable to the communities that we represent, knowing that there is a legacy of exploitation and research of these communities, but also a way to share knowledge, right? To find out what did they learn and can I relay that knowledge to other artists so that they can do the process better and that we can continually build capacity within our own communities. I think if you look at this trailer, right, it looks a little like Hollywood, right? These artists do a really good job on literally almost zero resources. Um, and some of these shows have sold to HBO and Netflix. Um, other of them have trended you know, very widely on YouTube and other social media platforms. Um, but this is not commercial television, right? This is inviting audiences in, um, and this is activating um, the archive in a new way. Um, for me, I found myself funding and developing cultural production to preserve a sense of life now with the understanding that Hollywood is not real life and this indie grassroots roots world is closer to the lives of these people that you see here. I could not talk about this without first foregrounding the value and challenges of video. I've talked a lot about video and the ways in which it can show the richness of experience at a given time, and that is definitely true. The problem with video is that it is data intensive, right? Here you see a headline, which we've seen met throughout the 20 teens, that Netflix alone accounts for significant percentages of downstream internet traffic. You know, going back to closer to 2012, when they started streaming, there were certain nights where Netflix was accounting for anywhere from 30 to 40% of all internet traffic in the United States, one website um, alone. And video accounts for the majority of internet traffic. Um, there is an abundance of video online, right? So what I'm talking about with OTV, we've released, you know, well over 100 hours of video. But when you look at YouTube, well over 100 hours of video, video is uploaded to YouTube every single minute. Estimates have it as much as 500 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. And that's just YouTube. Most platforms have video. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, all have video platforms. Um, of course, we have the possibility of capturing the nuances of historically marginalized experiences, um, but how much of it can we actually store is a huge question, right? Most of this probably will be lost to history um, in some shape. 
And yet video is not the only artifact developed from what I would call this digital archiving in process process. <laughs> um, so this process of making video creators robust archives and artifacts due to the complex interdisciplinary multimodal nature of video practice presents unique opportunity for communities whose lives have been abridged in traditional archives. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go through the process that we work with with artists and show how at each stage there are unique and quite different archival possibilities that are quite unexpected. Um, not everything I'm gonna show you, I am actively archiving. In fact, I'm using this talk, talk to sort of put down uh, stakes in the road to remind myself um, when I get the resources to start preserving some of these um, artifacts. So every process starts with the development, which is the conception of the story moves to production. When the thing is produced, it is distributed. That goes to audiences through exhibition platforms like the internet, like apps. And then for me as a researcher, I look back at that entire process and understand um, the possibilities and challenges at each stage. When we talk about development, we talk about the conceptualization of the story, and we can think about the script, right, as the first artifact. Um, the script is often printed. It is often a physical artifact because it is needed on set to guide production, right? And it's people don't typically want to have more screens that they have to charge on set in order to um, figure out what they have to do next. And multiple people need copies of things. So you don't really have the situation where you have like 50 iPads because every crew member might need to know what's happening next, right? The prop master needs to know the DP, the director, the actor, et cetera. Um, so I, we haven't been preserving scripts, right? Um, but scripts often have notes that are written in production which feature changes or um, ideas that people have. And that goes to how these worlds, right, are being created. But there's other developmental spaces in this project, in this process. We've done more work to help artists, even before they write, figure out how do I write? This is a, a photograph from a event that we did at the studio for the Wachowskis. Um, Lily Wachowski is a pretty big supporter of the platform. Um, she, you know, she's the director of The Matrix amongst many other well-known films. Um, and she and her, late stage of her career has viewed her legacy as enabling other people to kind of have the success that she has had. So at her studio in partnership with the Sundance Institute, we hosted something called Emerging Storytellers of Chicago. And we gathered a dozen to 30 of our artists to work with representatives from Sundance and filmmakers who had had films at Sundance to help them figure out how do I talk about my story? You know, I have this idea for a story. How do I get people invested in it? How do I talk to executives? How do I talk to funders? How do I talk to other creatives about why this story matters? Before we even started on the collective work of helping them create their stories, our head of community at the time, Jenna Annis, created these things called Brave Space Agreements, which is very much like the agreements that you had before this talk, right? It's the kind of, what are our, the values that we bring to this space? She wrote them down on this little mirror um, with beautiful font. I don't know how she did this. Um, she has incredible writing. Um, and it was a way because our artists are often talking about very vulnerable stories. You know, many of our artists write, from, write about traumas that they have experienced or harms that they have experienced. That can get very sensitive, right? Um, and we want them to feel safe and brave being vulnerable because that is essential to quality storytelling. And so um, these Brave Space Agreements are meant to set that scene. And again, I hadn't thought about this as a artifact, as a non-digital artifact that is part of our digital process, but I wish I had saved this little mirror. Um, I love how she wrote it on a mirror because anyone who looks at it can see themselves in these Brave Space Agreements, right? And it's just a way in which we have these agreements online. We've created a video recording of these base, Brave Space Agreements, right? So it's not about preserving the words themselves, right? But it's about preserving this instantiation of it because it was so unique to the space where, because we were curating a space with Sundance and institution that has historically excluded our communities, we didn't want artists to feel nervous in this space, right? We wanted to, them to see themselves as brave agents of their stories. Of course, production is a resource intensive environment that um, creates lots of opportunity for digital archiving. Of course, I think that when Jackie Stewart 
Jacqueline Stewart pr proposed the idea that I was archiving. I think she was thinking primarily of the shows themselves, right? Um, which are beautiful. And I think, you know, she had been looking at celluloid archives and eight millimeter film, super eight film, um, and thinking about how hard it was for her to access those archives, digitize them, um, which she has, there's DVDs of some of the um, independent films that she's studied. Um, and she was thinking that, you know, we don't wanna lose these shows to history because these shows are not archived by large corporate institutions that have, you know, vast amounts of service, server space for all their intellectual property. Um, however, I also think about the production spaces, right? Production spaces have tons of really unique artifacts from costume, costumes, from props, uh, to even the makeup that the um, actors are using, each of those can be highly, highly culturally specific, um, reflective of the fashion and styles of these times, of the values of these communities in this particular um, milieu that we are um, discussing. I should note, just as an aside, we think about production in a really robust way. And because we are small scale and working outside of mainstream institutions, including unions, which have their own histories of discrimination, um, the people behind the camera for OTV oftentimes reflect the people in front of the camera, which is super rare in Hollywood. And I think that creates much more compelling storytelling for our different productions. Um, that has been noted in two of our most popular shows, Brown Girls, which explores the friendship between a Black woman and a queer Muslim woman, and Code Switch, which is a friendship comedy of different kinds of South Asian folks living in Chicago. <clears throat> Both of these shows, despite having incredibly low budgets, have built sizable audiences and have both have sold to major Hollywood corporations, I think because there's a richness to the acting that you can get when actors are looking at people who look like them behind the camera. And I think that for me, forms a theoretical justification for archiving um, these particular productions. Because when you look at your pose on TV, I guarantee you behind the camera does not look like in front of the camera for those corporate shows. So we are a distribution platform. Um, that's our little app logo. And you can find us on all your devices. Um, for me, this independent distribution platform is a living archive, right? All of our productions live on this app. This is where they are accessible. Um, we work with Vimeo to publish this app. Vimeo makes it really easy to start your own TV app. Um, so we work with a corporation that is part of a broader conglomeration, IAC, um, that archives our video right now and stores it. Of course, as I mentioned, there's lots of video and this is very expensive form of archiving. So we're really happy to have that corporate support. But I think all the time, what does it mean to be working with a corporation, right, on our distribution and how sustainable is Vimeo as a corporation, right? So doing this process, I am following Vimeo's corporate history and wondering like, how healthy are they? If their stock takes a tumble, do I need to start thinking about backups, right, for this video? Of course I do have backups, which I will talk about later. Um, and Vimeo is actually doing a really healthy business because in the pandemic, everyone wanted to start an app. So they have actually spinning, spinning off of their corporate over, overlord because um, uh, the corporation thinks like they can just sell the company um, because they're making so much money. They've hired like 100 people in the last year. Um, rounding out, we think about exhibition really robustly at OTV. Um, exhibition for us is both live and digital. Um, an exhibition occurs in a range of spaces, um, both live and digitally. Um, our digital spaces of exhibition have shifted. Our app is relatively new. We launched that in 2020. Before that, we were on Vimeo's open upload platform, which is free to use for the public for the most part. Um, and we also publish on social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, et cetera, <laughs> publishing original video, publishing photos, um, publishing GIFs, blogs, original writing, sometimes even audio. Um, so we show up in different digital spaces, even including our own website, right? Where we have a lot of those artifacts also uh, published, a website that isn't run on Vimeo. In terms of exhibition live though, um, I love how, this, how digital video travels very seamlessly throughout spaces. We have shown in the biggest theaters in Chicago, we've shown many times 
at the Chicago Cultural Center through a residency at DCASE. We've shown uh, many times at the Museum of Contemporary Art here. We've shown at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum, National Museum of Mexican Art. But we've also shown a uh, video in homes. So right here, you see pictured um, an intimate event that we hosted at the home of Dr. E. Patrick Johnson, who is now the Dean of the School of Communication at uh, Northwestern University. He has a beautiful home that he has built for bringing in community for various kinds of events. He's kind of one of the most notorious and well-known hosts in Chicago and very much when he was living in Bronzeville, he now lives in Evanston because Dean life is real, right? Um, but when he was living in Bronzeville for 20 years, he was very much an anchor of the community as kind of the black queer mother, if you will, of the Bronzeville neighborhood. And so it was an honor to have events at his home. This was a fundraiser for the, the project itself. Uh, at the time, Dr. Johnson was on our board, which he's no longer because of conflict of interest because he's my boss. Um, but uh, we were fundraising for the platform and for one of my projects. And we always like to bring in different art forms into our exhibition spaces. So we don't ever wanna just show video if we can manage it. Sometimes the venues are too big and we have too much screen. Um, but here we worked with a number of different artists, including two musical artists. One pictured here, Alexa Gray, uh, was classically trained as an opera singer at Northwestern, um, is a black non-binary artist, counter tenor, an incredible singer who had done a number of video art projects, including one that is on OTV called Sur la Nuit, which is a kind of poem um, and operatic slash R&B kind of video art experience, which is stunning, you have to watch it. Um, so here they are singing an excerpt from that piece. So it's something where you can go on the platform and watch the video, but now you have this embodied experience, right? I think here about uh, Diana Taylor's um, archive and repertoire, this notion that um, multiple communities across America perform the archive through their body, right? The archive actually exists in the transmutations across generations of different art forms through communities that preserve their histories through oral and embodied practices when physical archives might fail them. Um, and we have photo of this performance. We don't have video of this performance. This is something where it's ephemeral. You had to have been there, right? But I do think about perform, uh, preserving the photo. We do video uh, the some of these exhibitions, less so than we used to in the early years where we used to have a lot of these inter, intimate artisanally crafted screenings. This one is at a bar in Wrigleyville, right next to one of the most iconic queer bars in Chicago called Smart Bar. Um, this is the premiere of a short film from a drag artist named Shea Coulee, who some of you may know as the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race all-Stars season five. This was before she even went on Drag Race. She created this beautiful short film that is very much an ode to Chicago's queer community and a fashion film, an ode to her ability to make clothes um, because part of her drag is that she, at the time, made a lot of her own costumes. She has a BA in costume design. So here's Jay Coulee talking about this um, exhibition, which I think was really important to her because she, is a host of a regular night at that bar and at the bar next door, Smart Bar. Um, and so she was able to show her community in a space where she regularly exists that she's not just this live drag artist that lip syncs to pop songs, which she does very well um, and is a complex art form in and of itself, but she is now also this filmmaker, right? And so I really love this video. I really love that we are able to cap capture this moment in history in video. I really think several decades from now, we will be looking at Chicoule on the level of RuPaul as one of the iconic drag queens in American history. And here is a moment that, you know, most people in her fan base, the millions of fans that she now has, has no idea happened, right? But everyone in Chicago, which is where she birthed her artistry, knows about this um, moment, this very important pivotal moment in her career, because the following year, right after this, she was on RuPaul's Drag Race, I think it was season nine. Now let's talk about exhibition online. Um, where, where do these productions show up? Where can our community find them online? How do we exhibit them online? Um, you know, social media is an interesting place to think about archiving. Um, it's variously difficult or not to archive various kinds of social media posts. 
in Instagram, which is our best social media platform, it's where we have the most active audience. Um, you add, they're actually, every user has the ability to archive their posts. Um, it's only available on mobile, which I think is really interesting. You can't get this in the uh, browser app. Um, and I, in preparing for this talk, I was reminded that a lot of the digital artifacts that we have created through OTV have actually been through my own personal social media because I was running this project under my Northwestern Re you know, Research Program as an experiment. Um, I posted a lot about this project um, and I wanted to save all of those postings because even in the comments and the likes, there's interesting nuance and context as to how were we exhibiting on social media? What were people getting from when we showed up online? So what you see here are snapshots of my own personal Instagram archive. Um, and each one of these posts is a unique story from you know, press that covered us. Um, this is when we did an exhibition in Berlin, um, which was only a these actually couple posts right here are from our Berlin. We showed in a gallery in Berlin. Only a couple people showed up to this little screening of um, OTV, because obviously OTV isn't based in Berlin. We didn't have a big audience in Berlin. I think it was about a dozen people. I worked with this uh, at the time PhD student, Karina Griffith, who was studying black filmmakers in Germany. And she wanted to refract that conversation with black filmmakers in the United States. And that was a beautiful experience where we have photo of that. Um, I think there's actually also an audio uh, recording of the conversation we had after screening our work in Berlin, which I think will be um, interesting if anyone is archivally interesting, interested in OTV. Um, this is our screening at the Art Institute right here, um, our screening at the in Chicago International Film Festival. I produced a pilot and directed a pilot of my very own in collaboration with a really experimental writer's room and I had a reading in my house and this is a photo of that reading in my house. This is a music video that I appeared in as an extra from one of the artists whose music video collection we have in on OTV. I mean, there's just every one of these is just a unique way in which this digital um, experiment manifested across the world in these physical contexts and in these digital contexts. Finally, really briefly before I wrap, um, of course, I'm a researcher and I take research very seriously. And then I note, I think about my research as a form of building this archive um, from the interviews that I do with artists about their production process in this article in which I re-theorize production value through this process to um, this study of how one of our most popular shows, two of our most popular shows, Brown Girls and Blue Hosts, uh, manifested both online and in cities around the world. Both of these shows did screenings outside of Chicago. They artisanally crafted these screenings in collaboration with universities, community groups, active troops, poets were like a huge drivers of these screenings. Each screening was a unique experience. For this article, I interviewed people who screened this in their communities and asked, you know, why was the screening important to you, this little digital show? What did it allow you to do in your city? Um, I also coded how these, um, the websites that published these videos and what were the different communities that we can glean from the types of websites that published them, what communities can we glean showed up for this. And I found that the identity specific websites, the blogs, the um, magazines that focused on queer people and women and black people and um, South Asian people, all of whom were really authentically represented in this show. Um, those were where most people showed up, right? So here I am showing how, how community found this work, right? Um, both in space and online. And you can see and access these reports if you go to weare.tv slash research. I also interview our community and our artists about what they think about OTV and those reports are also published on the website, which I think are really important. And finally, before I conclude, I think I've run a little long. Um, I wanna talk about future needs and struggles for this process. Of course, all of you are probably aware that all of these artifacts take money to preserve, right? So funding is critical in archival practice, right? And funding really brings us to the importance of institutions um, in archiving, and I'll get to that last se sentence in a moment. Um, of course, for archiving in servers in multiple places, that takes a range of different kinds of resources from physical hard drive, hard drives of which I have so many, um, they're so expensive to buy and they have to be continually attended to because they do fail. Um, 
the cloud has become an essential uh, part of our practice because we're generating you know, more and more data. And even though you can get physical hard drives over one terabyte, um, we're starting to reach the place where you can't host our archive on one single hard drive. Um, and so we host a lot of these artifacts on um, Dropbox, on Google Drive. Northwestern has its own kind of Dropbox called Box, um, which is nice because while Google Drive and Dropbox charge me for the, how much data I use, you know, Northwestern thankfully does not charge professors for how much data they use. Um, and, but that takes time, right? So there's even like staff labor that was required because I am too busy to upload every single thing to Northwestern Box. I need undergraduate and graduate research assistants for that. Um, of course, you might note that a number of these companies are private corporations or publicly traded corporations. And many scholars from Sophia Noble to Bob McChesney to Mark Andreevic in Europe have called for what Andreevic calls public infrastructure for the digital landscape or digital public infrastructure. We should have government funded servers for archiving our communal, our communal artifacts, right? Our communal digital artifacts. Um, of course, also we have nonprofits like universities that do that as well, like Northwestern and Vimeo, right? As I mentioned, is a form of this digital archive. Um, ultimately, you know, digital preservation is a craft, an ongoing dialogue between the affordances of media, the intentions of creators and curators, and the institutional commitments and resources that enable preservation. I'm quoting there from, again, Trevor Owens, who is the Library of Cong Congress digital preservation expert. Institutions are essential in this process, but the legacies of exclusion in these institutions present unique challenges. So I wanna end on this anecdote where one of our artists came to me saying that, you know, they were starting to think about their legacy as an artist, um, because like I said, we've lost artists already in this process, even though they're super young. Um, and they asked me, so what can OTV do for preserving my archives? And this was a multidisciplinary artist. So they had created video work for us, but they also had a lot of physical artifacts. They had like prints and paintings and photos and fashion. Brilliant, brilliant artist, Keon Junio. And I told them, well, you know, I told them everything I told you. And I also mentioned that I was, you know, working with Northwestern to archive the video to make sure that it was preserved beyond our limited resources as a community-based organization. And they actually told me that that was a negative for them, <laughs> that I was working with Northwestern and that they actually wouldn't want their video at any large institution because of the ways in which large institutions have historically excluded for them non-binary Philippinex communities. Um, I was really taken aback by that. I thought that that would be a plus. I was saying, oh, it's great. Like, even if OTV ends up not existing because we're continually fundraising to exist, uh, Northwestern's been here since the 1800s. So you can trust that it probably will be preserved there. Um, and so I leave that to make sure that we humble ourselves and not think that we are saving communities, but rather that our communities really need robust forms of archiving, that this is a craft that is social. They want people from their communities to be the preservers of their legacy, and they are highly distrustful of large institutions. I think we, people like me, are intermediaries between these communities and institutions and can form that bridge, right? But we can't make, we can't make it that only large institutions, large nonprofits and corporations are the holders of our stories. We also have to lift up the community-based organizations that are actively in community, in conversation, in constant dialogue, right? Going back to what Trevor Owen says about that dialogue, that ongoing dialogue um, with the people who have been impacted by systems of oppression. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Christian. That was fascinating and um, very relevant. There's many, many applause emojis in the Slack. <laughs> I'm waiting to see if there's any questions, but if we could all clap for you, I know that, that we would. And I'm looking forward to downloading OTV on my Roku player yes. uh, and, <laughs> and watching all these beautiful shows. Um, it's excellent. Everyone is, is very excited. Um, and let's see, I'm waiting to see if anyone has any, any specific questions for you. Um, and 
I would love to hear, Carolyn, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think we would all love to hear about the work that you're, you're starting to try to do with, with Northwestern libraries. And it also occurred to me when you were talking about that need for the community preserving their legacy. Um, there's this saying in digital preservation that lots of copies keep stuff safe. Mm. So there may be an opportunity there to take advantage of the fact that at least when it comes to the digital artifacts, we can sort of do both um, for safety. And maybe that's part of what, um, part of the way that you can talk about the Northwestern Libraries project, just one more way to keep things safe. Um. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to um, steal Dr. Christian's thunder. <laughs> Thank you so much for your keynote. Um, I, I, the only thing I'll say is that we're in conversation with Dr. Christian about um, a small set of OTV videos and acquiring that. Um, and I know, I think you just alluded to it, <laughs> um, updating those agreements with some of the artists um, was the first step. Um, but there might be challenges there. So I appreciate the, the work you're, you're trying to do. Um, it seems like it is a balancing act for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I will say that the biggest challenge in that, because we talked about this earlier this year and it's been a little stalled, that's mostly just because, been because of me <laughs> because I'm just too busy <laughs> um, to like, I've had to rewrite the contract and then I have to like talk to all the individual artists and. Like I said, I interview all the artists every year, but like I put off those interviews until like, cause our whole production cycle was delayed because of the pandemic. So like, we're actually releasing a lot of stuff right now. And I'm like, just in the process of doing those interviews. So it's gonna be a process. It's gonna take maybe a little longer than I thought it would. Um, but it's really interesting. Like even just the labor of contracting as like part of this process um, is something that I didn't quite think about, but it goes to, you know, when you're living history, every moment seems so precious, but you only have so many hours in the day, right? And it's just not going to get done all at once. <laughs> we have a question. Uh, what are your thoughts about discovery? We catalog items we hold in our libraries and archives, but would it make sense to collaboratively catalog these kinds of collections that are managed by communities independent of libraries? <laughs> Wow, what a great question. Um, I think about this often just because categorization is so essential to, I think, all digital forms of digital practice, even if you're not even thinking about it as an archive, you know, like when we tweet, we use hashtags, right, which is a form of categorization. Um, and on our app, we want people to discover the shows, right? So we think about what are people going to search for on the app to find this content? Um, and so we, we do it internally as a team, but I'm often made aware that we all think differently and we think about different things. And I would love to bring community into the process because I think that is super duper essential. Um, there are ways in which there are forms of categorization that sometimes community will do just in the practice of doing things. So you post an Instagram post, some post someone comments and they describe something in the post that it is attracted to them, that becomes a keyword that we can draw from, right? Um, but I also think about what would it mean for us to actually contract and work with our community to categorize all the things that we have because they might be thinking about them in ways that we're not thinking about them. Um, yeah, yeah. There's actually much more to say about that. Like there's this artist I work with who created this beautiful pilot for us called Conspiracy Theorist, um, which is about broadly a black woman grad student who is um, contending with her own neurodivergence in academia, which is already kind of a mind fuck, right? <laughs> Especially for black women, um, excuse my French. So, uh, you know, whenever we talk about her project, I'm always made aware that A, she thinks about it very differently, very differently than I do. And also, um, she's always thinking about it differently. She's constantly doing like new cuts of it to like refine it. Um, and so each cut might engender new forms of categorization and it might be incumbent upon us when we have staff capacity to check in with artists about their projects over time and ask them, have your perspective on this project shifted? Um, so yeah, that's just some thoughts I had to that question, not necessarily fully formed yet. 
No, that that's fascinating. That's a completely different way and, and a very interesting way to think about like, yeah, arch archiving live embodied archiving over, over time. Um, just checking the chat here. It's not any questions right now, but there is some discussion about the the concern of social media as an archive, um, as a place where so many people store important work. And like you were talking about with the, the importance of the context of the comments and the, the other things that are brought to your, to your personal Instagram. And maybe you would have those photos, but if Instagram went away, would you have the context or how in the future would we be able to read um, the context of, of those materials. And for how long will any of those companies keep things up, right? I mean, are we going to be in 2050 still being able to access posts from 2010? Like, there is a physical barrier to the amount of server space these companies require, and there's also ecological implications to that server space, right? Um, and as we think about climate change, I can imagine a future I almost hope to imagine a future in which our government says, you might need to limit server space because of its ecological imprint and the amount of energy required to keep them running and the amount of physical space and land that is required to take up all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't trust social media. Um, and even outside of corporate influence, um, you know, web series that are in my book that aren't that old, you know, that are maybe only 10 years old have already disappeared from YouTube. Um, and I've been trying to fundraise for an archive of independent television from the early 20th century. There are very popular shows like, you know, Broad City, which is a hugely popular show on Comedy Central. There's a season of that web series before they created it, which is a really fascinating artifact of how did they make that show on their own without corporate influence? And how did that shift when they got their big deal? Um, one of those seasons is gone. You know, I, I was teaching it in my classes and it's gone. I don't know why, maybe it was a rights issue. Oftentimes it's a rights issue. You know, they have, they use something they don't have the rights to. Sometimes it's an interpersonal issue with like people who made it. There's differing conflict around who owns it or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, sometimes artists are just ashamed of their earlier work and they take it down, you know, they're just like, I don't want anyone to see this, this is when I didn't have money and now I have more money and my work is better now, right? But for me, I'm like mm, tens of thousands, sometimes millions of people watched your shitty work, right? And like, that actually matters to history. Like someone, some historian is gonna wanna know how were people making TV for like no money? in this early 20th century, because that might not be possible in 50 years for whatever reason. That's a great point. And we have a popular question here. Can you expand on the concerns that you've heard about archiving with institutions? I'd love to hear more about these critiques so that we can learn. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, I think there's a lot of fear from artists is what I'm hearing. I think there's a lot of fear about how the materials will be used, who will be using them? Um, how will they be framed within institutions, right? Um, a lot of the artists that I work with, I think because they hold identities that are difficult to categorize and the whole theory of intersectionality really is about defying categorization itself. Um, there's a wonderful article on intersectional methods from Lisa Boleg, which is much cited and it's called when black plus woman, plus lesbian does not equal black lesbian woman, um, basically says that like the ways in which we segment identities is completely incommensurable with intersectional identity. And she's thinking about quantitative methodology. And I think artists think about like, am I gonna be put in the queer archive at Northwestern or the Filipino archive at Northwestern, right? And what would it mean for me as a queer Filipino to be in these two separate archives? I think that's just, one concern. Um, I think about the fact that many of our communities have been studied by universities specifically, um, and there's this whole experience they have with researchers where we come in, we collect our data, they relay their stories of trauma and harm or whatever. That goes into our journal articles and our books, 
that become inaccessible to them, either inaccessible because like journal articles require like a university subscription, a library subscription, or books are just written for academics and just they can't understand how their stories are being translated to like scholars. So I think I come across this when it's like, when it's like people's skepticism of universities um, specifically, I think there's probably other institutions where they have other concerns that I can't speak to because I only work in the university institutional context. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, we will all be very anxious to hear if there's ways that Northwestern finds to make that easier, either with the contract or or with sort of helping artists guide how they're how their work is talked about or categorized. So that's a great point. Yeah, you should invite me back to do this in like five to 10 years and I'll have probably better data on how do we negotiate these, these situations. Very cool. Waiting to see, it looks like there are a few people typing, typing but a lot of conversation about ways that um, some very institutions want to, to be thinking about this and are already, already thinking about this. <laughs> And how to how to fix and build trusts and with those sorts of relationships with communities. I think it really is that about that. I mean, that really is the thing. It's about the relationships. It's about the continuing to come back. It's about asking questions, um, listening, trying to integrate that as much as you can to your pra practice. Coming back with something, asking more questions, getting that feedback. It's really trust building, right? Um, and so, I know that's really hard in institutions because you have other things to do besides building community, right? You have other jobs. Um, and so maybe it's also about, you know, the staff capacity within these institutions to like have staff to specifically to check in with people who are living, who are in archives, who are whose information is being stored. Because um, just my general, as someone who comes into my community with my own privileges, um, and is perceived as a person of privilege within my own community. Um, I have found that when I've had conflicts with the people that I work with, it's about kind of just saying, okay, I hear your concerns, I'm listening, and I'm here for you whenever you want to hold me accountable, whenever you want to tell me more, um, not being defensive, right? Not making it seem like I'm resistant to critique. Um, and being transparent about my own limitations, which is something I've learned about. Like transparency is so key. And sometimes just letting people know, this is the institutional context that I find myself in. These are my institutional constraints. Mm -hmm. Letting them know that can actually be really informative because then the things you're saying are not about you and they understand where it's coming from. Um, and I've come into that issue, not as it relates to archiving, but just, in terms of the practice itself, I realized that some of the conflicts I've had, I was just not being transparent because I thought artists didn't want to hear it or I had to be vulnerable and talk about resources I didn't have. And I didn't want to let them know my own limitations because I felt almost ashamed to not be able to support them in the ways that I wanted to. And that that's just not conducive to trust building. That's a great point. Thank you so much. I'll give it another minute in case there's another question. There's a lot of notes on what a great keynote this was and how much insight it's given. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. This has been a real treat. It's nice for us to hear and think more about how the technology gets used and what it's preserving and what it's presenting. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to a community of people who I don't normally get to talk to. Um, so this has had me thinking about my work in a different way. Um, and it's going to be super helpful as I try to build on this practice. Fantastic. I'm glad that we could do that as well. Well, let's see. I think we're, we're running right on time. I think we're going to take a break now and come back at 20 after the hour. So uh, 1220 Eastern time. Um, and we will continue on with some of our presentations. Cool, thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone. We're at 20 past the hour. So I'm gonna hand things over to Kim for our next presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me share my screen here. All right, can you all see that? Looks great. Fantastic. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kim Lehman. My pronouns are she, hers, and I am an IT project manager at Princeton University Library. I'm also uh, a product owner for Figgy and Digital PUL, known as Deepol, which are a couple of our library applications here. I know she'll be speaking with you all soon enough as well, but I'd like to briefly introduce my colleague, Ellen Ambrosone, who is the South Asian Studies Librarian at Princeton and who we have been lucky enough to work with on the initiatives that she'll be discussing in greater detail this afternoon. One of this year's successes for members of IT and project leads within the library has been finalizing workflows and application enhancements for ephemeral content from external contributors into our digital repository known as Figgy. As many of you probably know by now, Figgy is the home-built digital repository of Princeton University Library. As the main tool for digital content management, Figgy allows digital files to be ingested from local staging servers, such as our digital studio and Firestone Library, for example, Google Drive, or external hard drives. Okay, so great, we have digital images. Uh, what about the metadata for ephemera? Ephemera in Princeton University and the projects in Figgy work slightly differently than that of standard ingests of content into our repository that are typically synced with their associated metadata from Alma, which is our new ILS, or finding aids by their unique bibli bibliographic identifiers or component IDs. Ephemera items are described directly in Figgy and have some of the most advanced forms of metadata entry in the repository, including support for controlled vocabularies management, which is managed and added to by our ephemera stakeholders in collaboration with colleagues from cataloging and metadata services. In most cases, the item level metadata may be generated by a variety of internal and external contributors with the subject knowledge and language specialization necessary to responsibly describe the items that have been digitized. In my role as a project manager, I found that in many cases when one hears digital collection, digital project, digital initiative, there tends to be a focus partially, if not entirely, on the digitization of the physical object and the basic description of that object. On its surface, these processes may seem straightforward. You digitize the items in-house, you hand over digital files in some way to IT or imaging to ingest, or request external access to a selection of repository material in need of metadata enhancement. IT colleagues then ingest the content into Figgy or make specific repository projects available to an external party. And then somehow magically it becomes discoverable in one of our library's wonderful applications. What is not always apparent is the amount of cross-departmental collaborative work it takes both before and after ingesting contributions into Figgy, and the time it takes to create sustainable ways to streamline future requests for similar content. Digital initiatives like ephemera projects Ellen will be telling you a bit more about today are in fact about everything from the selection, conservation, and prioritization of the materials to the metadata created or enhanced by contributors wherever they may be multilingual OCR, item level organization, structure, pagination, page labeling, enhanced cross discoverability in our applications built and are implemented here at the library. And of course, the functionality and enhancement of those applications. This all contributes to our digital content in order to make more effective research tools and a better user experience for the growing number of those needing to work with or contribute materials to these applications. An excellent example of this would be the repository enhancements and workflows that were created to support multiple use cases presented by Ellen to us in the IT imaging and metadata services department or items, which frankly is just a lot easier to say. Uh, Ellen's project needs required the joint collaborative work of IT or digital imaging studio, Ellen as the library's primary stakeholder and subject specialist, 
and the external international collaborators contributing to the digital South Asian and Sri Lankan ephemeral projects that are either hosted or held by Princeton University Library. Thanks to Ellen's use cases and library developers, batch ingestion of metadata and images, and CSV download of all ephemera project metadata into or out of Figgy is now possible for current and future external ephemera project collaborations. In order to create sustainable workflows that would handle bulk ingestion in this way for all ephemera projects when needed, the multi-step process worked on in large part by our colleague Cliff Wolfman took months to perfect particularly for review and standardization of submitted metadata, mapping controlled vocabularies, and has involved a lot of time from IT, Ellen, and the external stakeholders themselves. In addition to this option, because of enhancements made to Figgy and the digital PUL application, a separate workflow was created to responsibly give project-specific access to external contributors in India and Sri Lanka, for example, who are now able to contribute, work with, and enhance digital content directly in both applications. Okay, so why the two workflows? Although working directly in our application uh, within our platforms is an ideal option in most instances, establishing an alternative workflow that was not dependent on reliable access to stable internet connections or to allow flexibility if needing to accommodate for external metadata creation work already underway, for example, was important for us to ensure. There are and will always be edge cases that for a variety of reasons may complicate or hinder potential future collaborators ability to contribute if we are unwilling to be agile in our own developing best practices and continuously building on what we learn from our users and stakeholders. To put uh, it into perspective in the context of Princeton University Library's mission, one of our own North Star statements reads, we will meet patrons wherever they are and democratize access to knowledge as a core component of the library experience. What better way is there to do that than through digital collections and initiatives like the collaborative South Asian and Sri Lankan ephemera projects and the applications that make it possible in the first place. Prioritizing user-driven enhancements and workflows such as these means we'll be able to support future submissions of ephemeral content from all areas and will provide the sustainable foundations for best practices for this type of digital content in our repository. We're proud to have been able to respond to our wonderful stakeholders like Ellen who ask, can you put this into Figgy? Can this work? By saying, yes, we can do that and working together to find new sustainable ways forward to do so. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with our colleagues and contributors and support the growing and diversifying repository needs of the Princeton University community. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to pass things along to my colleague, Ellen, and I will stop sharing my screen. Hi, everybody. Give me just a sec so I can share screen. All right. Thank you, Kim, for such a um, wonderful first part of the presentation and for introducing me. Again, my name is Ellen Ambrosoni, and I'm the South Asian Studies Librarian at Princeton University Library. And today I'm going to share with you a bit about our growing collection of South Asian ephemera and some of the feature enhancements that Kim and I discussed with her team in order to work with collaborators in South Asia and to make the items in our collection as discoverable as possible. So the South Asian ephemera collection actually walks in the footsteps of the Latin American ephemera collection at Princeton. LAE, as we call it, we call these projects LAE and SAE, so I'll be using that, uh, those names today too. Uh, so LAE launched about six years ago and has been building steadily ever since. And when I started at Princeton, I actually inherited the metadata schemata for LAE when we decided to pursue creating a collection of South Asian ephemera. And it didn't take long for me to figure out that SAE was going to pose new challenges that would require support from Kim and her team. So the central challenges that we've been thinking about over the last couple of years include creating ways for international collaborators to use Figgy, adding and or adapting fields to accommodate original language scripts and facilitate discovery, and data extraction for internal and third party use. So one of the biggest hurdles that we have with materials from South Asia, as you might imagine, is the sheer variety of languages 
um, that we have represented within the collection. And we, we wanna represent that digitally as well in order to capture South Asia in all of its diversity. No one person can know all the languages in the collection. So very early on, we needed to find a way to make sure that materials in various languages would be processed and made discoverable. We decided to trial outsourcing metadata creation to a trusted vendor in India who regularly provides metadata records for physical items. To do so, I asked the items team whether we could provide our vendor with a login and credentials to work directly in Figgy. After a few conversations to sort out how we could do this securely so that the collection as a whole would remain safe while they worked on a limited subset of items, we were able to set them up with their own collection in Figgy where, they could ingest, where we could ingest items on a rolling basis and they could work directly within Figgy. Similarly, we recently collaborated with the American Institute of Lankan Studies or IELTS in Colombo, Sri Lanka to make a collection of materials produced by radical activists from the 1960s to the 1990s available digitally. Our collaborators produced Google Sheets with the related metadata and the items team worked to create a way to automatically ingest the metadata into Figgy rather than having to manually enter the data for almost 600 items. As with lots of these projects, it took quite a bit of trial and error, and we learned a lot along the way. We now have a way to meet collaborators where they are, whether that means working directly in Figgy or ingesting spreadsheets. And ITEMS has worked on a way to verify metadata before ingest to ensure that, we will that it will populate correctly in Figgy, thereby reducing the need for so much data entry by hand. Similarly, I've also worked with Kim and the developers to suggest feature enhancements that will allow users to search more intuitively for items from South Asia. For example, items in South Asian languages are described both by using the original language script for certain fields and in Roman script. Unfortunately, the Library of Congress romanization tables are often difficult for non-librarians to internalize and use when they're trying to find items in the catalog or within our digital collections. To try to mitigate this difficulty, I asked items if they could create a keyword field where we could enter more intuitive ways of romanizing South Asian languages. And here I wanna show you an example. So this is the homepage for the dissidents collection. And one of the items that we have in here from the Women's Education and Research Center is a periodical called Pravahini. And what's special about Pravahini is that um, the creators actually made the conscious choice to publish that periodical, sorry guys, I can spell, I promise, <laughs> uh, to, to publish the serial in three languages. So it comes out in English, in Tamil, and in Sinhala. And this matters because the heart of this collection is really about resisting notions of rival ethno-nationalisms during this period in Sri Lanka. So if we take a look at the results that we get for the periodical, you can see in English, Pravahini spelled pretty intuitively. Um, and here, if you look at number five, let me just scroll to the top. This is in Sinhala, and again, still transliterated pretty much intuitively. But if we keep scrolling, scroll, scroll, scroll. And you can see if we look at number 24, which is in Tamil, um, even though we would pronounce the name of the periodical the same, this is Pravahini, it's Romanized quite strangely. Um, and so if someone searched in a more intuitive way, they would miss the fact that we have this publication in Tamil as well. So the keyword field is really critical in this regard because it allows us to um, bring all three aspects of this publication together in one search. So a little bit more about the keyword field. As time progressed, we also decided to allow our international collaborators to enter keywords in English in the field when they couldn't find an appropriate subject heading to describe an item. So this feature not only gave them more agency over how they describe the items in their own collection, but it also serves as an important diagnostic on our side. So now from time to time, we can actually audit the keyword field to see if we need to add a formal subject heading to our list of controlled vocabulary. 
So lastly, I want to mention another feature that items created that has been an absolute game changer for South Asian materials, and that is the ability to extract the metadata from the collection into a CSV. So this feature was originally developed so that we could actually share the data from the Sri Lanka collection with the South Asia Open Archives, which is an open access repository of materials from South Asia. Sawa wanted to actually federate the discovery of the collection in their interface. And this was important on our side because it added another valuable layer of discoverability for the collection. So items created this functionality, which I've since used not only to share metadata with a third party like Sawa, but also for metadata cleanup projects for the rest of the collection. And this has been an unintended use for the feature, but also an incredibly valuable one as we work toward launching the broader South Asian ephemera collection, which will be going public very soon. To wrap up, I just wanna say how incredibly rewarding it is to fail forward as we build these projects. I have absolutely relished my conversations with the items team who are a group of curious, smart and kind people who genuinely want to know what the challenges are for these materials and to find IT solutions so that we can represent these items well in our collections. Without being able to have this kind of exchange, it would make our collections far less varied and diverse, which I think we all know is not the best path forward. I often spend time dreaming about the kind of elasticity that I hope we can build into these systems over time so that we can remove barriers to collaboration and create digital collections that are meaningful to the communities represented within them. And I'm gonna stop there and um, thank you again for listening. Thank you both so much. This is fascinating. Excuse the cat meows in the background. It's lunchtime. Um, stopping to see if there's any questions. We'll give in a minute. There are a couple people typing. Just want to give them time. Looks like it's a lot of praise from your colleagues who are very happy to work with you. Give this one more minute. Okay, there's a question. I had a feeling one was coming. So this question is the use of keyword to capture what isn't capturable using controlled vocabularies is a very real experience. What controlled vocabularies are you using for these ephemeral collections at this point? Kim, do you mind if I sort of- Not at all, Joanne. Yeah, so the um, ephemera vocabulary is sort of inspired by the LC subject headings but it doesn't map and correspond exactly. And that um, the sort of core list of um, subject headings was developed when they were focusing specifically on the Latin American ephemera collection. Um, and so now that we have this new geography coming into play, we're finding that, um, that there are even certain terms that maybe we wouldn't use in a South Asian context that are perfectly acceptable in a Latin American context. And, um, so we're trying to figure out ways forward for how to how to deal with those shifts. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, we like to have we like it to be inspired by LC, but um, they don't map exactly.
All right, we have some, another question. Did you vet the metadata for accuracy? Did you ever have to change anything that you felt was inaccurate? I mean, generally speaking, the people describing these collections, they, they are like the community members that it means the most to them. And so um, if we made changes like content-based changes to the metadata, it was something we did in collaboration with the IELTS folks who were creating the metadata. We did find, I mean, just romanization is so difficult. Um, and we did find, you know, romanization errors and things like that along the way. Um, but generally speaking, we didn't intervene on like how they wanted to actually describe the collection. It was more like formatting concerns and things like that. Am I right, Kim? Does that yeah, ring true? Yeah, absolutely. And even the deep hole exhibit that Ellen showed to you as she was doing her search, none of that was published until individuals actually working in that in the unpublished back end. So our collaborators in Sri Lanka, for example, reviewed that content. And then I believe, yeah, we got a sign off for them and then we published it. Yeah. I do, can I add one anecdote? Oh, please. And, and that is, I know nobody's asking a question, but this is important because we're talking about the keyword field. Um, we really didn't know what would happen fully with that field. And, um, but Kim and I are explorers, I think. And the IELTS folks, when they created the metadata and they were able to use that keyword field, we had a meeting just maybe four months, I think, before the collection went live. And they actually asked us if in the results, like when you would search and you would get the results, if we could make the keyword field visible, but not the subject heading field, because they felt that their keywords were more important than the subject headings. And I think for Kim and I, on the other side, like getting that kind of feedback from our collaborators was really um, like inspiring to keep going, that even though sometimes these features, they don't function perfectly or the way that you expect them to, they're, they're meaningful and we, and you have to keep going and you have to receive that feedback and then keep working along the way. So that's just something we didn't get to build into the presentation, but that I wanted to mention. Oh, that is so excellent to hear. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next presenter is Trey. Trey, if you're ready. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me see here. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, looks great. Awesome. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, Friday at the end of a conference, I'm going to trick you all into looking at some code. Um, I am Trey Pendragon. I work for Princeton University Library. Uh, and we're going to talk about background jobs. Oh, and I'm going to click the thing appropriately. So here's sort of what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to talk about what a background job is and why you might use them. Then I'm going to share how you might use them in a pretty complex use case of ingesting a whole book because life is complicated uh, and where Sidekick Pro might fit into that process. And then I'll do a little wrap up and spoiler alert, wrap up is one slide that says questions. Uh, so what is a background job? Well, uh, in summary, it is a job that happens in the background. So <laughs> uh, it is, to show an example here, it's in this little screenshot, you might hit this button that says upload files from server and you might pick a bunch of files and then you hit okay. And the important piece is that the user will immediately get redirected with some sort of message that will pop up and say, hey, I'm working on it. Uh, and the server in the background will distribute work to a variety of backend processes that will actually do that stuff. So 
why might you want to do this? Uh, some really common examples are creating derivatives, sending an email, uh, doing bulk ingest, changing properties, preserving items, and re-indexing. And I would say all of those are cases where it's really like how long it takes for that thing to happen determines whether or not you want to put that thing in the background. Uh, but another use case is just anytime you want to do any sort of parallelization in Ruby, this is like splitting a process up across multiple backend servers is a way to get things done faster, uh, largely because Ruby just doesn't come with like some sort of way to run stuff simultaneously and across servers. So using this worker mechanism is the standard way of doing it. All right, great. Now I know what a background job is. What is my software actually going to look like? Uh, so Rails now very helpfully has active job. Uh, it's had it for a while. Several of you have probably used it. Uh, it's built into most repositories and I don't think a repository would work without one. Uh, the concept is I've got like a standard API that have a variety of backends that perform slightly differently, um, but they all sort of point to different kinds of backends. Uh, some common ones are Sidekick, which is a thread-based solution, which persists to Redis. Uh, Rescue, which is very similar to Sidekick, but uses workers instead of threads. Uh, so it's like forks new processes for every job. Uh, also stores to Redis. There's sneakers, which uses RabbitMQ, which is the real like message queue uh, instead of just the key value store that's Redis. So you get things like message acknowledgments, which are nice, uh, but I'm not going to talk about here today. There's delayed job, which is nice because it just uses active records. So it's really easy to install. And a new one that I hadn't known about until prepping for this is Good Job, uh, which just uses Postgres to persist to and seems to be a project in 2020. Uh, I will say I think Sidekick and Rescue is still the most popular, and Sidekick is recommended by the Hyrax documentation and is in the title of this talk. So that's what we're going to be talking about. All right, I promise code. So here's an example of sort of what a sidekick job will look like. Um, this is sort of a condensed example, but doesn't miss any, like this is, I condensed it in such a way that I refactored in a way that I'll probably go and do for real. But the use case here is say I delete a parent that has like 6,000 children uh, because it's a book with 6,000 pages. If that user had to wait for 6,000 pages to get deleted and those things to get deleted off of disk and all the messages to send, uh, they'd be sitting there forever. So instead, we queue up these background jobs, uh, one per file set, and it looks like this. You just pull that. Uh, there's a bunch of Valkyrie stuff here. Don't really worry about it. Uh, but you just pull that thing out and you delete it. And there's this little rescue for if that object in an ex didn't exist in the first place, and you log a message. Um, so you might have expected me to sort of gloss over this weird rescue thing. Uh, I would like to say that it is definitely weird. Uh, the, you'll see this a lot in Sidekick code. Sidekick is very nice, uh, unlike some other backends for active job, in that if your job throws an error, it will retry ex with an exponential back off and give up eventually, but eventually is like days later. Um, this is really helpful for if like solar goes down or your server goes down or some external service is broken uh, or your stuff just isn't in the right state, it'll error. Um, this is a problem for me because I get honey badger errors when these jobs break and I don't want to see that email. Uh, so there are times when a job will just never succeed. So if like this object isn't just going to sporadically appear if it turned out it was gone. 
So rescue it uh, so that it, the job doesn't error and then log a message so that RuboCop doesn't yell at me, to be honest. All right, we're now pros at writing background jobs. So let's talk about what, let's talk about our complicated use case. So this is a super common use case at Princeton and probably a pretty common use case at other institutions, which is I need to ingest a book. Uh, so let's say I have a 500 page book represented by 500 TIFFs on a server somewhere. I wanna put those images on a server, hit a button, and eventually it'll tell me that it's done somehow. Um, so I put all of those files uh, on an appropriate server location. I put in, in Figgy, we put in like a, a metadata ID. That's like, this is where you should import metadata from. Here's the visibility, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get this nice little button that says save and ingest. Um, obviously, if they had to wait for the whole ingest to be done before their browser returned, uh, I'd get a bunch of messages in Slack and I, don't, I get enough of those. So instead, they'll just immediately get a message that says, okay, I'm working on it. And then it'll distribute to a whole suite of background threads uh, on a variety of servers. So here's the strategy. Uh, they hit the button. It will create the parent record. This is like the book. And it'll queue up an ingest job uh, pointed at like the directory where all of those files that it's going to ingest to are. Uh, and then it'll redirect the user. That ingest job is going to copy 500 files to the repository. Uh, it's going to create 500 file sets, and it's going to take a while. If I were in your shoes, I expect this is the time when you would say something like, Trey, you just promised that if I wanted to parallelize things, I would want to use these background jobs. Why are you doing all this in one job? Uh, the issue here is that it's really important that those files show up in the same order, uh, and which is a lot easier to do if things are sequential, uh, which is really easy to do if they're all in one job. So page six on the file system really super needs to be the sixth member in order on the book. If I wanted to parallelize that, I would need some sort of like magical system that would like distribute across a cluster of machines and return some arbitrary return value for the file sets that it created and finished, and then be able to combine those in order. We're not talking about magic today. So there is, after those ingest jobs happen, there are 500 characterization jobs that queue up. This adds technical metadata to every file set. Uh, things like checksums or MIME type or other technical metadata. Uh, each of those characterization jobs finishes and queues up a derivative job that creates a derivative, probably for your triple I viewer or something like that to work. Or I don't know, if you have 500 audio files, then maybe it's HLS partials. Um, it's not really important. It runs some sort of derivative process. This process is probably this should be super similar to what's in Hyrax and is basically exactly the thing that happens in our digital repository as well. All right, you did it. Good job. Everything shows up. Um, it works for like a long time, probably. Uh, and But eventually, a couple of things are going to go wrong. Uh, so the first thing uh, is a pretty important thing. If you kill that sidekick process or your operating system like runs out of memory and decides that killing the sidekick process would be a really good way to get it back, uh, that job is gone. And you will never know, uh, except for maybe someday, years in the future, somebody will say, you know, page 36 is gone. Or they'll be like, I was pretty sure I ingested this book. Uh, it's it's really sad when something like that happens and these ingest jobs are super important to run. So how do I fix it? This is usually 
when an institution goes and looks at Sidekick Pro, either because of some sort of presentation for this or because Sidekick is really good at advertising the fact that they fixed this uh, via their Pro product. So the process for implementing this is I hit a button, I give them some money, uh, I add this little chunk of code to an initializer somewhere, and I restart my server and my sidekick panel, which I'm not going to show too much, but I probably should have, is going to have these little reliable ticks on the side. Uh, that means you won't lose jobs anymore. Done. All right. So now one of two things has happened. Either you don't have that problem anymore, or you decided you don't want $1,000 want all your books to ingest. Uh, life is great. Well, uh, except for, for one, one little problem, uh, which is that we forgot a requirement. And that is, I need to know when this thing is done ingesting. There's now a thousand and one jobs before my thing's done, even more if I add preservation. How do I know that they're all done? So if you look at this use case and you're used to writing your own software, you'll probably go through a thought process that looks like this, which is maybe I can keep track of the status of the jobs or at the end of every job completion, maybe I'm gonna like update some sort of like notifier that's like, oh, I've done 506 of these. Or, and then if I add like a preservation step to the end or something like that, then I guess I'll update that process or maybe I'll wrap it all up in some sort of manager object, or maybe I'll just like hide in a corner and like forget that this is a thing so that I can be happy with my life. Um, but let's say I did all of the above and now I have race conditions, like, two things updated at the same time and they both check and like they neither of them think that they're the last one so nobody updates so it never notifies anybody does that mean i need some sort of locking like locks are hard how do i know what kind of lock i need i put a lock in and now my database is stalled you know maybe you just don't need to know maybe you just don't put this feature in maybe it's fine just go check the web page sometimes Uh, so long story short, just don't do this to yourself. It's a lot. Uh, you might figure it out, but I promise every other developer who works on it will hate it and uh, hopefully won't get blame you for it. So instead, let's be happy instead. So I want to talk about batches. Uh, so Sidekick Pro has this feature that lets you group jobs together. And when all of the jobs in a given batch are done, uh, it can fire a callback. Batches can be nested, uh, which means that when one batch finishes, uh, it can be like, oh, I have more stuff to do. Don't fire your callback yet. Please queue this job and wait for this job to be done. Um, you get a nice little thing, like a nice little notifier here that will tell you sort of how much stuff you have to do for your batches. Um, and it kind of handles all of that locking business locked to job process instead of um, like, instead of Ruby and in your Postgres database, it stores it in Redis where your jobs are tracked. Um, there's, here's a link to the documentation. Um, I'm just going to say that it can handle pretty much any workflow you could possibly imagine. And let's look at some more code. Um, I will say at first that we are not doing this yet in our repository. We're using batches in our, for indexing in our catalog. Um, but this is sort of how I imagine this would work. So first thing you spin up a batch, you tell it what your callback is going to be. In this case, it's ingest manager ingested, and you give it some parameters to pass uh, at the end of that callback. And then you add the jobs that are part of it. Um, our ingested thing just like marks that resource as you're not ingesting anymore. Uh, the ingest job is pretty simple. Uh, I've commented out all of the exciting parts. And instead, just for 
every file set that you end up creating, queue up a job. Uh, the job sort of knows what batch it's been spawned from and queue up a characterization job. Uh, characterization job looks the exact same thing. It knows which batch it's a part of and it can queue up jobs within it. And that batch will not complete until every job that has been queued within it has been successfully done and the callback succeeds. Um, importantly, if you want to add processes, you just add processes to the end of this the same way you would normally. And as long as you make sure that they're added to that batch, it will just take care of knowing when to fire that callback appropriately. All right, I want to talk a couple of times about or a little bit about some other Sidekick Pro features. Uh, you have the ability to pause queues, which might be important if you're, for instance, ingesting a book for six hours. Uh, then you might want to like wait to finish before deploying. Like it might be safe to run that job again, but you'll probably end up with files like copied somewhere, and you don't want to have to pay for that. Uh, so you can pause the queue, and you can you can deploy when it's empty to make sure that that queue doesn't get picked up by anything else. And there's an API for that. So you could even do that as part of your deploy process if you wanted. Uh, it pushes metrics. Uh, you can add expire times for jobs if you have jobs that like have been queued for a long time, but it doesn't make sense for them to run if it's been queued for a day or something, right? Like if I do a daily report, I probably don't want a daily report if it runs tomorrow. Um, and there are a couple of API improvements that I'm not, I'm just not gonna get into. So what's the catch? The catch is if you want to use batches, uh, you don't get to use active job. It's a pretty big catch. Uh, if you have your own repository, uh, migrating these are super easy. All you do is get rid of the inheritance and include sidekick worker. And your method is named the same thing. And you have to make sure that you're passing basic arguments, mostly strings uh, as arguments. So if you're passing around objects, you got to stop doing that. Um, if you have a Valkyrie application, you're probably stopping doing that anyways. Uh, this example is one of our actual ones in real production. The other thing is I'm not really sure how you would do this in Hyrax. Not everybody's going to pay for Sidekick Pro. Um, and you can't use Active Job. It's kind of a bummer. I don't have a great solution for you. I'm really sorry. Oh, and this is our my famous wrap up slide. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Trey. I'm going to give people a minute to put in their questions. Okay, we have, is there a way to check or validate the results of ingesting a big book? Yeah, so batches uh, come with in a, so, okay, there are a couple of things. Um, the callbacks make it easy to do a manager if you wanna keep track of it, like on the resource, you don't have to really worry about uh, race conditions because there's a very clear beginning and end point. Um, alternatively, batches do have, like, they're queryable. There's an API for it. You can pull their status out. Um, so you could do that instead. In the one case where we've implemented this, we ended up doing a manager because we had to keep track of, we had to keep more track than we could do just as properties on the batch. All right, another question. Have you tried Factory, F-A-K-T-O-R-Y? Uh, I believe this is, uh, no, I have, I have not. Uh, my understanding is that that's 
the sidekick author's more generic version. Um, but I have not tried it. Great. Another question. Can you undo a batch job? I uh, I, I don't understand. Can I undo a batch job? Maybe somebody could, could clarify this for me. Yes, I'll give the <laughs> questioner a minute to, to put that in. Uh, there is a question generally, um, I think for you, Trey, or for, for the community to put into Slack. Uh, has anybody tried any free queue management tools that are similar? Um, yeah, I don't know. The, I, this sort of batch processing thing is pretty hard. My only memory of try, the community trying this in the past is I'm pretty sure. Oh boy, a uh, long time ago, probably 2016 or 17, I seem to have a fuzzy memory of Michael Klein doing a, a Ruby version of keeping track of your jobs. Um, but, uh, I have since not heard of anything like that. Okay. And there was a guess at maybe what the other question was, if it was maybe about, um, if you make a mistake in your batch and need to undo it, are you aware of anything to do that? Um, there is very good advice in the documentation, um, and there are there are callbacks in the batch for like uh, I've failed like some of my jobs have failed. Um, so I think you could set up a strategy to handle like I've messed up, but I, you would have to reach into the documentation. I haven't done that myself. Okay, another question. Um... The questioner says, I may have missed this. Is Sidekick Pro running the jobs remotely, uh, S-A-A-S? Oh, uh, no. So you still, so you spin up Sidekick as a process on some machine that runs your application code. Um, and that process will speak to a shared database, whether that, uh, in the case of Sidekick, it's a shared Redis queue. Okay, and I see another question in, I almost missed in Slack. If we solved this on our own, wouldn't we learn how to solve the problem and avoid spending extra money at potentially multiple institutions? Um, I, good luck. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a hard problem. Um, I don't, I'd be really curious about the cost benefit analysis of that. Um, there are solutions in other languages that provide similar options, uh, but I can't, yeah, I don't know. I'd be, if you pull it off, great. Tell me about it. Um, I'm always happy to save money, but it, I hope it doesn't cost me more money than it would just to buy Sidekick Pro. All right, another question. Uh, can you or are you parallel processing at the book level or given you can't at the file level, are you doing anything else to speed processing assuming you have multiple books to do? Uh, can you repeat that for me one more time? Sure, is in the Q and A. Um, are you parallel processing at the book level, or given that you mm. can't at the file level, are you doing anything else to speed processing? Um, this sure. So the the ingest jobs can be so that top level thing that like goes through and creates all of the files. Those can be queued simultaneously as well. It's just the process of like adding the files to the parent record all happens in one background process rather than one background process that takes a long time 
rather than like 500 that happen relatively quickly. But we'll often have multiple books ingesting at the same time, for instance. All right, great. You've generated a whole lot of discussion in the Slack. So I think this has been a really helpful presentation. Uh, give it one more minute in case there's another question. All right, not seeing any. I know we all know where to find Trey and this might continue on over the break in the Connect Slack channel, but thanks so much, Trey. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're running about 10 minutes early, but that's okay. That means we'll just take a 20 minute break instead of a 10 minute break. And we're gonna come back here at uh, half past the hour. So 1.30 PM Eastern. We have a whole bunch of really great lightning talks to finish out Connect. So I hope you will uh, join me here, back here in about 20 minutes.
All right, welcome back everyone. It's time for our lightning talks. First up is gonna be Jen Young with uh, Andrew on deck to go next. So take it away, Jen. Hello, I'm getting ready to share my screen. All right. Um, hello, my name is Jennifer Young, and I am the metadata coordinator at Northwestern University Libraries. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am talking to you today about changing the subject, uh, thinking globally, acting locally, um, is my cheeky way of uh, talking, uh, describing what my talk is going to be about. Um, changing the subject is also a name of a uh, short documentary um, that talks about the process that uh, Dartmouth proposed for um, changing the subject of illegal aliens to something that is not illegal aliens because humans are not illegal. Um, so, and which got the involvement of actual Congress uh, in it. And it's a very fascinating documentary if you want to, it's freely available if you search for it. But um, what I am going to be talking about today Yes, so there will be a little bit of um, just a brief content warning of violence and racism in what I'm talking about. But here's the situation. Um, Meadow is our repository, which is awesome. All of our access points have URIs because we love linked data. So all names and subjects have to have a URI in our system, which led to the creation of a local authorities um, uh, module, if you will, in Meadow so we can make sure that things that are not in uh, the vocabularies that we already use, we can add those locally. Um, and this is also tying into a um, effort that the libraries in general are putting together to sort of address systemic bias in our metadata um, historically and currently. Um, so I've also linked to a GitHub repo where um, for our Northwestern University's local authorities, which is mostly um, based on uh, Alma and what we were doing there, but it lists the um, subject headings that we are initially starting with. So we are starting with um, slaves and slave narratives and all those related headings. There's a whole list if you go to the GitHub repo. Um, so we wanna change things from slaves to enslaved persons. So in Meadow, uh, if I do a subject for a slave, there's six um, headings uh, for that. This is our um, local authorities dashboard. Um, you can see that um, you have the label, which is what displays to the public. The hint, um, which we've, I've been kind of using a sort of um, what project uh, this is part of, um, sort of like every posters or we have, um, the Curtis collection, which is Native Americans and things like that. And then you could see the, I, the ID is the URI that gets minted for these materials, for these headings. So um, also thinking about um, language. So we have um, these West African manuscripts that in Alma records have um, keywords that are in Arabic, but then also like the ethics guidance and those were created by members of those communities. So we wanted to make sure we retain them, but we also wanted to have URIs for these things. So um, it's another way of addressing that um, locality that we want to maintain. So here's a little interface of it. It's really simple. It's just whatever I want the label to be and then any hint. It, I don't have to have a hint, um, but I'm using it. And then this is after I create it and you'll see um, down at the bottom, you have fugitive enslaved persons, and then fugitive slaves, and then the URI, URI that is minted there. Um, and you'll see like uh, these, uh, the other fugitive slaves, they're, um, they're from our migration, which just happened uh, earlier this year, where we wanted, we just sort of minted everything locally, and then um, we're going through the cleaning up and, and actually um, making them proper headings, if you will. So, let me see. All right, so here's the little video of a process. Uh, I looked up fugitive slaves, there's seven works. Um, so now I'm going to batch edit 
and it really is this fast. I have to say, it's amazing. I love it. Um, so I, now I'm going to, I'm saying I want to remove the Fugitive Slaves heading, and now I'm going to select the local heading. So I'm selecting Northwestern University Library's local authority as their control vocabulary, typing in fugitive, and it pulls up the heading I want. I go boom, boom, boom. And then um, I have to go back up to the top. Um, I don't have to give it a batch nickname. I did just so I know, remember what I'm doing. Then I have to, I understand because this could be destructive. Um, and then um, I have the little batch edit dashboard and it, I did pause, but it did take about less than a minute for it to complete. And now I can click on that and it shows me everything that's in that batch. So, and then I can look to verify that um, what I did was the, the fugitive slaves um, is now fugitive enslaved persons. So this is the process that we can use to sort of remediate or, um, or address those reparative practices that we want to enable in our systems. And, oops, and that is my talk. So thank you, um, feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, and I, I don't remember who um, Heather said was going next. That would be me. <laughs> Can you see my slideshow or can you see my face or both? Both, looks great. Great, all right. Hi everybody. My name is Drew Myers. I work for the GBH Educational Foundation, formerly known as the WGBH Educational Foundation, but we dropped the W for excellent reasons that our marketing department will no doubt tell you about. Um, so this is sort of an add-on to the developer support and engagement working group presentation. Um, one of their goals was to identify challenges of developer participation. And <clears throat> in the slides, uh, anything that's underlined is a link. So their findings were uh, compiled in a Google Doc that is linked here, uh, appropriately called Challenges for Developer Participation in the Sambara Code Implementation. And inside of that document, you will find a discussion on the challenges for what they called one-off contributions. And they defined one-off contributions as uh, creating a PR that addresses a single issue outside the scope of a larger effort. Uh, you know, plug-in-y like things. And it was suggested in that same document that a lack of plug-in architecture might be preventing some plug-in like contributions that may be helpful for others. And then someone said, wasn't there a plugins working group? And yes, there was. Uh, and I facilitated that. And some of you here were probably a part of it. And so Maria Whitaker reached out to me and asked if any of that work might be able to be carried forward uh, within the context of the efforts of the development, I forget the name of it, development support and engagement working group, which by the way, I'm not a member of, I should state that. Um, but it was because of the overlap of what they were talking about in this working group and uh, previous work from the other working group that Maria reached out to me and asked if I could give a lightning talk on this. And so I agreed and I concluded after reviewing some of the deliverables that we had of that working group um, that maybe, maybe some of it, uh, really quickly the Sanvera plugins working group uh, produced a set of guidelines for plugin development. Um, there was additional aims to try to actually <laughs> write a real plugin that adhered to these guidelines, but due to capacity limitations that I'm sure we are all familiar with, um, that part did not happen. But the guidelines are still available in the Sanvera Labs uh, GitHub organization. Uh, they were not widely adopted. <laughs> they didn't get a whole lot of traction. Um, in retrospect, I would have to say that plugin was very loosely defined and so being able to provide specific guidance on how to really interface with hyrex um, was really hard because there was lots of different places to interface with hyrex and um, the a lot at the time the folds in the code weren't particularly suited for you know all kinds of plugin work so um, you know we we reported on our findings, we had these guidelines, and then we ended the working group. Um, after the fact, 
uh, back when we still had our W in our name, uh, WGBH and IU collaborated on a batch ingest plugin, which is also still available in Sanvera Labs. And we're actually using it in one of our apps. So please, nobody delete it. Um, and in developing that plugin, uh, we basically tried to adhere to our guidelines and we succeeded somewhat. Um, I, I attribute a lot of that success of you know, folding smoothly into Hyrax, basically due to the fact that this particular plugin just kind of stayed out of Hyrax's way. <laughs> so it might be a useful example in showing how to write a Rails engine that doesn't step on Hyrax and doesn't allow Hyrax to step on it. Um, but other than that, the, as an example of how to write plugins moving forward, I'd say that it's very fairly limited. Now, while we were creating this um, plugin, there were a few other batch ingest efforts underway. Um, and one of them eventually became Bulkrax. And at this time, it has much wider adoption and it is um, much more mature. And I think Rob uh, gave a presentation on it earlier, Rob Kaufman, and said that it's all but ready to come out of Sanvera Labs. Um, it's, it's ready to go. So I would say that moving forward, uh, exploring the patterns that Volkrax has used, which has a similar concept to the one that we developed, uh, looking at some of those patterns and how it you know, interfaces with Hyrax uh, would be a good step forward. And it's the patterns that I kind of wanted to focus on here. Uh, from the experience of going through the plugins working group, um, I was thinking maybe a plugin architecture is not the best term to use. And part of that is due to the very nature that, you know, a plugin may be large, it may be small, it may touch the front end, it may touch the data model. You know, there are a lot of different places where it may interact with Hyrax and its scope may vary widely. So the concept of having some sort of central plugin architecture into which all manner of plugin could be plugged, um, that's a heavy lift, right? Um, so I think a better approach would be to ensure that Hyrax has nice folds in the code that cater to good plugin patterns. Um, and that brings me to uh, the Hyrax event bus, which is a pattern that has been, um, it replaced the old Hyrax callbacks system um, and is a much better model. Um, in fact, the Hyrax callbacks, I think, are deprecated in version three and are slated for removal in version four. Um, there was a comment in the document that the developer engagement working group, you know, they were asking about the callbacks and, um, and whether or not they just hadn't been publicized enough to the, to the community. Um, the answer is they're going away. So use the event bus instead, it's a lot better. And it follows a uh, pub sub model that is based on the dry events library, where someone, uh, you know, Hyrax defines a set of events. And then as Hyrax goes through its stuff, uh, through its life cycles and stuff, it will publish data to these events. And then you can plug your custom code in to listen, to subscribe um, to those events, basically listening for when they happen, receive that data that Hyrax gives you, and then carry on uh, your, your custom code. And as far as examples go, I was looking in the Hyrax code um, and I found 11 event listeners at least um, that are doing stuff following this model. So to call them plugins, I don't think is exactly right. Um, however, they, they behave in a similar way that a plugin could behave. So in my mind, I think that this is just a great pattern. Uh, if, if the goal here is to basically come up with a refreshed set of tutorials, guidelines, examples on how people can make smaller contributions, one-off contributions, uh, so to speak, to Hyrax. Um, putting forward some examples following this model, I think is a great step forward. And so that's basically my presentation. Thanks. Uh, any questions, you can hit me up at my email here or I'm on Sanvera Slack at AFRIT. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. I can't wait to see what comes from this discussion coming back up. All right, next up, we have the Indiana University Collections folks. So I think Adam and Daniel. Thank you. 
Uh, hello. Yes, uh, I'm Daniel Pierce. I'm here with Adam Plache. We're both developers at Indiana University Libraries. Um, we work on, among other things, a project called Digital Collections. Uh, Digital Collections is a Hyrax application that we're intending to use to replace a wide variety of our legacy applications. Uh, ranging from Pages Online, which was based on Princeton's old uh, Plum application that later they rewrote to become Figgy. And that houses some pretty large musical scores uh, in the range of several hundred pages. Um, and we're also intending to use this to migrate uh, some pretty old Fedora 3 backed image repositories as well. And uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Jim also helped out on this, Jim Halliday. Uh, we've soft launched digital collections, but we've only really imported a small amount of data into it. Uh, so there's a lot of work ahead for us. Uh, to help us along with that, we are using bulk racks, as Drew gave us a great introduction to. <laughs> um, and as Drew also said, uh, Rob gave a great presentation on bulk racks. Uh, we're using it mainly with the CSV parser, uh, as well as a slightly customized XML parser that we use for METS. Um, we are also using the Allenson Flex gem, named for uh, Julie Allenson. Uh, this provides what we call flexible metadata support. Uh, as you can read there, Allen's and Flex is a gem that lets you dynamically edit the machine readable metadata modeling, the M3 schema, to modify uh, work types, uh, contexts, which are admin specific display characteristics, mappings, and properties while the application is up and running. Uh, we worked with Notch 8 uh, to make this. Um, they made this great graph excuse me, graphic, I believe for last year's Connect, I can't remember exactly, um, gives a pretty good overview of how it works. Uh, if we zoom in on the middle part there, then we can see uh, kind of a general overview of what's involved here. There's a version metadata profile that you can create and associate with work types. And then uh, that can be associated with, with collections in the form of what we call context. And then through that, we can go in and change the specific metadata properties that are visible on those work types in, when you're looking at it uh, as part of certain collections. Um, it's not been a completely smooth road, especially integrating the two. Uh, and Adam's going to talk a little bit about some of the things we've done to make those two work together and just some of the other issues we've run across uh, while doing digital collections. Uh, hello, yes. So the first thing that we ran into is that after Allison Flex was working in the interface, uh, we found that when we ran ingest via bulk racks, and also another process we used to pull metadata from the card catalog, and both processes were dropping all of the flexible uh, profile fields. And it turns out that's just because those weren't in jobs and they had spun up um, an initialized talents and flex. So, you know, that was actually pretty easy to fix. And once we had, had that change in place, those were working. Uh, the next thing we looked at was uh, the metadata profile version varying over time and being able to specify which version we wanted in case the CSV had been built for an earlier version of it. And uh, then finally, once we had all this metadata, we realized we didn't always want to show all of it. Uh, so Daniel, if we look at the next slide, we can see this is from the development environment. And at one point we accumulated uh, 22 different versions of the profile. And uh, the next slide you can see it at different points in time, I had made objects manually. And when you make something, it uses the newest version of the profile that's currently available. So the next slide shows I've made a couple of works. Uh, you know, one was version 15 and one was 22. And if you go into edit something, 
uh, then at that time you have the op, you know, you can update it to the newer version. Uh, but we, you know, we didn't want to run into the uh, issues that could crop up if you had built something for ingest to an earlier spec and it maybe changed. So uh, the next slide shows we made some changes to uh, the Polkrex importer so we could specify a version of the profile, which defaults to the newest one. But you can specify one for the CSV. You can also specify it object by object, but generally you're going to want to batch import to all be for the same version. Um, so yeah, that's the profile stuff. Uh, can you ban Daniel? Yeah, here's an object that I made up on my system that's not actually a picture of Princess Street West. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of information showing in the catalog that we don't necessarily want to display generally. There's some sort of more system related backend fields like the date uploaded timestamp, workflow status, OCR status. And then we've got some you know, more normal metadata, but it's possible we want to hide something uh, like the, maybe we want the creator to not show up in the public view. So uh, in the bulk racks profile editor for each individual property, you can tweak a whole, whole lot of uh, things. There's quite a lot of detail available, um, but uh, the next slide shows in the indexing properties, we added new option. So making something stored searchable makes it shows up in the catalog, show up in the catalog. Facetable makes it a facet. We also added this admin only flag. And when that's in place, it's still indexed uh, according to what, you know, those two values chosen above, but doesn't necessarily show up to everyone. So I think the next slide is again, uh, showing when I'm logged in the upper right corner as a ploche at IUEDU, I'm seeing all this stuff. But uh, on the, if I'm not logged in, then the creator facet, which was second down from the, the top, uh, disappears. And the creator field disappears, along with several other of the um, ones we're hiding that are, again, more back end stuff, like timestamps and workflow status. Uh, so, yeah, those are the three kind of main categories of, of changes we, we needed to make, uh, which I guess brings us to the wrap up or Daniel, you want to take it back? Uh, sure. So going forward, um, we'd really like to work more on Ounce and Flex. Uh, we're trying to potentially become kind of the leadership for that gem. Uh, we definitely want to send some of the fixes and improvements we've seen from digital collection, uh, get them merged into the gem. Uh, should be easy since it's in some bear labs. Uh, hopefully we might also optimize some of the performance. It is pretty chatty when it's looking up the various parts of the dynamic schema. Um, yeah, we'd like to see some other people making use of it and potentially even getting it integrated into core Hyrax so we can have avoid developers having to edit all 17 or so uh, files just to add one measly little metadata field. So there's kind of our goals. Um, we'd love to have some help with it. Uh, Nache has been great working on it. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Uh, there's some links to our repositories, to digital collections, and our email addresses. We're all on Slack, of course. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you both so much. All right, our next lightning talk is from James Griffin. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. All right, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is James Griffin and I am a digital infrastructure developer with the Princeton University Library. And for this lightning talk, I'm going to be providing a brief overview of a current project that we are developing, uh, branded Oranos, um, and it addresses automating the deployment of Ruby on Rails applications um, with Capistrano to server environments. So very briefly, um, 
Ornos is a deployment management platform. It's um, implemented using the Ruby on Rails framework. It itself is a Rails application. And it was actually originally developed as an Atmos, as a, a project branded as Heaven, managed under the, uh, the username Atmos on GitHub. Um, the rebranding included uh, just using the, the reference to the Greek God of the Heavens, or it was from Greek mythology. And if um, one takes a look um, on GitHub, I, I can go into a bit more detail. Heaven itself, just as a warning, has been archived. So this really needs to be sort of maintained as a, a live fork. Um, the architecture um, for, uh, for, for Oranos is basically that it sits um, between uh, uh, any development environment and server environments in which one is going to readily deploy a Rails application and utilizes a, the GitHub deployment API. Um, it utilizes a number of different deployment strategies in order to basically manage the deployment of different GitHub um, GitHub projects, and uh, we currently use a single strategy within the Princeton University Library, um, one based off of um, Capistrano, which basically uses SSH in order to uh, log into and um, uh, clone the Ruby on Rails source code for any given project. Um, however, there are more complex deployment strategies that are supported upstream that I that we've been looking to port. Um, one um, is uh, based off of Heroku, the um, the the cloud service provider, um, and also Fabric, a framework implemented in Python actually for um, working at a low level with um, server environments. So, it, in order to provide a, a better visual um, representation of of what I've just tried to outline. Um, this is from the GitHub documentation. Essentially, uh, Oranos is basically the application that interfaces directly with the GitHub API and manages um, to basically manages the, the deployment events and, de and deployment status updates here. Um, so essentially, this is represented, Oranos fills this gap um, the third party um, uh, column, if you will, within this, this swim lane diagram. Essentially, the tooling here, um, which is something, is something that exists independently of uh, Ornos itself. Um, and GitHub is actually um, what, what manages the individual deployments of a given project by managing these events and statuses um, between GitHub and Oranos as the third party. Um, where Capistrano is actually situated within this workflow is that it basically, it, Oranos in response to receiving notifications from GitHub uses uh, Capistrano over SSH in order to deploy and use Git clone to, do, um, to, to actually ensure that the Rails application is accessible and ready for access on a given server. Now, um, the GitHub deployment API itself, um, what lies within this, this lane, is basically just a web API over the HTTP for tracking individual project deployments. Um, it's fairly message driven in the sense that the API will receive, say, an HTTP request to create a deployment. Um, so uh, the tooling here, this could be anything, um, um, it's said like a curl request or, or, or any sort of get request to, or a post request, my apologies, uh, a post request to create a deployment on the API um, will be received by GitHub. Um, GitHub internally will note that a deployment for a given project has been created, and then a webhook notification will be issued in response to whatever services happen to be listening on either end of this um, in order to basically ensure that you now know that you now know as a consumer that, that GitHub has um, deployed your, is ready to deploy your, your project and, and ready for you to basically hand everything off to Oranos. Uh, so webhooks are pretty pretty heavily utilized in this, and I didn't 
want to and it, um, basically go too far into detail into this for the um, the purposes of keeping this this presentation um, within the scope of a lightning talk, but it should be noted that within the GitHub um, docs, which I've linked to in the slides, there's a pretty fair amount of documentation regarding what you can expect from the GitHub API when it comes to managing um, the web hook um, deployment events. So one can see here that one receives basically a JSON payload that could be parsed. And within this payload, you have access to say, um, not just the, the URL for um, an individual deployment that's been created, but you can specify the environment in which the, the, the application is being deployed, um, um, the, the user associated with the deployment and uh, quite a bit of metadata about the the, um, the deployment itself. Now, um, I've made reference to this tooling column within the, the, this diagram. And essentially these types of tools that are used in order to create deployments um, are actually separate from Oranos and um, typically it, it varies a bit depending upon what your team supports, but one project that's used internally within uh, the Princeton University Library is uh, Hubot, which is basically a, um, a, a generalization of a GitHub internal chatbot that's, that's used to manage um, application deployments from within Slack. And basically, um, for our team, we have available um, a, a dedicated channel, which allows a user, say myself, to come in. Uh, we branded this pull bot, um, uh, give it an instruction to deploy a given application, as well as an individual branch name to say the staging environment. And the bot itself is, is um, has some interaction where it basically um, indicates that it's received this message and then it, it basically provides two updates indicating that the, the deployment has been created and the status of the deployment. So as one can see here, that's primarily what the, the you know, um, the Qbot um, uh, branded as Polbot is doing within this swim lane is basically ensuring that one can, can readily actually create the deployments and um, receive, you know, update the status of the deployment um, within Slack. Um, branding for this is typically uh, referenced using the, the term uh, portmanteau uh, chat ops, uh, chat operations. Um, also, as a brief aside, um, the server environments uh, for um, into which one deploys your application using Oranos um, or really with the, the GitHub deployment API. An entire on, on the whole, it's entirely unopinionated. So um, we at, at Princeton internally use Ansible, but if one happens to be using some other configuration management solution, that that again is, is really lies outside of the scope of of this service. Um, right now, and very unfortunately, Heaven has been archived for some number of years now. Um, so the hope is that while um, the project um, at Princeton is going to have, you know, thorough support for working with deployment using Capistrano and, and some better support for, um, for, for using Qbot, I, I think that it's, it's mostly complete um, with that regard. Um, there's always the possibility that if Oranos might be helpful outside of the, the context of Rails applications, it, it need only be integrated with, with an application that uses Capistrano for deployment. So, I mean, um, other Ruby frameworks such as Sinatra could just as easily be used as Rails, um, even. Uh, and um, as was the case with the original uh, Heaven project, there's also the possibility of looking to support other providers such as Heroku or Fabric. Um, which basically would allow one to kind of interact with um, platform as a service providers. Um, one, can, one can also possibly think of maybe some sort of uh, like a, a container-based uh, approach um, where one could, you know, it, given that, you know, 
Heroku's platform as a service style um, architecture is slowly being deprecated in favor of containerization. Perhaps that's another, another provider that we can look to um, support in the distant future. So as this is evolving, um, I would please welcome any and all um, questions and comments at uh, jrg5 at princeton.edu. I'm also available uh, at JR Griffin uh, III in uh, the Slack channel. And thank you very much everyone for your attention and interest. Thanks so much, James. All right, our next lightning talk is from Brendan. Hi, I hope everybody can see and hear me okay. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, great. it looks great. Thank you. So hi, I'm Brendan Quinn. I'm a senior developer at Northwestern University Libraries. I go by he and him. And my talk today is about using mocks in our Elixir application ecosystem. Um, I go by he and him pronouns, and I'll also probably be saying we a lot. And by we, I mean myself, Michael Klein, and Karen Shaw, who gave presentations yesterday. So that's our backend dev team at Northwestern. So mocks, um, what is a mock? What do I mean when I say mock? Um, so this ancient blog post from 2015, um, the creator of Elixir, his name is Jose Valim, said uh, the Wikipedia definition is excellent. Mocks are simulated entities that mimic the behavior of real entities in controlled ways. I always consider mock to be a noun, never a verb. And that sort of struck a chord, I think, with the Elixir community and created a lot of discussion about what does Jose mean by uh, a mock is a noun, not a verb. Like a mock, um, in, in this context, how I like to think of it is that a um, a mock is something in your system, not something your system does. So um, I'll sort of go over a few examples of how we use mocks in our applications and talk about some of the goals and alternatives as fast as possible. Um, so the goals, um, our first goal is just to gain confidence in code that calls external APIs that we, we don't control, um, especially in our test suite. So we wanna make sure our code does what we think it does. And so we write tests to do that. And we write mocks to make better tests. Um, we want to avoid making external API requ uh, HTTP requests while running our tests. Like this is the old, like, I want to be able to run my test suite from the airplane or the train without an internet connection thing. Uh, we want our tests to be easier to write. And to quote Trey from a few minutes ago, we're not talking about magic today. So what we want to avoid is a, like fiddly tests where you're overriding function return values, like kind of, I used to do that all the time in uh, my Ruby and RSpec days. So what we wanna do here is um, just write code that lives inside of modules that's easy to understand and read and use and also configure. So uh, I have three examples uh, ordered by complexity, even though that's kind of a lie because um, one of them became more complex over time. So we have three, these three uh, bullet points here are all modules in our application. One is a media convert mock, one is an authoritex mock, and the other is a mock server we use for minting uh, arcs. So um, in order, so the media convert mock is, uh, came around because we use AWS Elemental Media Convert um, to transcode audio and video files. And um, we have a whole bunch of development infrastructure for simulating the AWS environment locally using Docker and um, Minio and things like that to simulate S3 and SQS and all these different tools that AWS provides. But we don't have the ability to simulate media convert transcoding. It's a pretty complex process and there's no like off the shelf tool out there that uh, can mimic that. So we wrote uh, a media convert mock that we use in both development and test environments. Um, and the mock simulates responses from creating jobs via the media convert HTTP API, um, which is basically what you do is you create a JSON template and you ship it off via the HTTP API to media convert and media convert spits back a response. It's basically like we're doing a thing or you didn't send the right thing. And so that, that will create or not create a job and send you a return value. So 
our initial implementation, this was basically the whole thing. I stripped out comments, but this is it. It's basically two public functions, configure and create job. And it was the only complication here is we wanted a way to be able to simulate failure. So um, the happy path is just returning okay and a fake job ID. And the sad path is um, if you put the string error somewhere in the file name in your test, um, it'll return an error tuple. So that was just a way to get us going um, with our um, ingestion pipeline, which sort of goes through steps of processing files for ingest. And one of those is send off the thing to media convert. So this allowed us to iterate quickly on that piece of the pipeline. And so that's the job. It's just, it's just a function in a module, just like everything in Elixir is really just modules and functions if you drill down far enough. Um, so sorry about the small text here, but you can kind of see um, what Jose was talking about, about how um, a, a mock is a noun, not a verb. You can see um, over here on line 44, it's we're calling media convert client, which is a, a private function down here at the bottom. And all that does is pull out of the configuration, the module that we want to use um, to call the create job function. So in production and staging environments, uh, we use the real media convert module. And in development and test, we use this mock module and they both um, define a create job function. And one does a real thing, sending an HTTP request to AWS and the mock um, has these sort of canned responses that um, as you can see on my next slide got more complicated over time. So um, I'll give everybody a minute to read through those uh, lines of code on the left there. Um, just kidding, that's just a way to show how this, this mock module got more complex over time. Um, so now it does things like copy files to a streaming bucket so we can do sort of a simulated version of streaming locally. Um, and then we added this transcode complete action later on because um, the asynchronous nature of media convert. So you send off the job and then um, later on the job will be updated with statuses. And then our final step in the processing pipeline is this transcode complete action. So our mock sort of just got more complex over time. And uh, the good thing is, is we didn't have to change how um, the code was configured or used within the action. It's, uh, it all works the same way. It just does more now. Um, the second example I wanted to talk about is um, the Authoritex mock. So really briefly, uh, we've given talks about this before, but Authoritex is an Elixir library we wrote for searching infection uh, controlled vocabulary terms inspired by questioning authority. Um, so we needed a way to populate works with controlled vocabulary terms in our test suite. So we wrote a mock. Um, it was also really helpful during our migration from our Hyrax repository to Meadow because the works already existed and they had controlled vocabulary terms. So we used the mock to um, flesh out those works in our migration test that we wrote. So um, there's sort of two sides to this one. It's sort of getting a little bit more complex. On the library side, we wrote the Authoritex mock module that implements the behavior that all the Authoritex modules provides, which is search and fetch functions. Um, and then the mock does a couple of extra things that the other ones don't do, which is um, initialize an Erlang term storage in memory cache. Um, that's just provided by the Elixir ecosystem. It's just like Redis or memcached. It's an in-memory data store. And the, it also adds a few functions to get and set data in that cache. And then on the application side, we call authoritex mock init to, um, in our test helper, before the test suite runs, it, it starts the uh, ETS cache for the authoritex mock. And then you configure um, the authoritex mock, just like all the other authoritex modules that you use. Uh, this one's for our test environment. We only use a couple. We don't use LOC or any of the other um, Authoritex libraries. And then um, we provide defaults uh, using a thing called a, a X unit case, um, which just allows us to share um, these mock records amongst our whole test, test suite. So I'll show really quickly what that looks like. And sorry again for the small font here, but you can see in yellow, it says describe tag authority file and a file path to a JSON. And then on the right here, you can see what that looks like. So that um, 
is just a, a pretty simple JSON file. It can be as, as short or long as you want. But um, so this is specifically these records that were part of the migration and we wanted to test the, the full functionality of, of migrating records over to our system. And um, so this one was overriding the defaults, which are kind of just like Mach 1, test 1, that kind of um, not real quote unquote data. So here we have a test that overrides the default to add custom authority records for a specific test. And then the last example I wanted to show was um, our Meadow Utils Arc client mock server. And this one is by far the most complex version. Um, we use the EasyID API to mint um, Arc identifiers for our works in Meadow. And um, we wanted a way to do that uh, in development and test without hitting the Arc API. Um, so the mock server here is an, is an actual web server that's running locally. Um, it uses the Cowboy web server and something called Plug, which in Elixir land is kind of like um, Rack plus Sinatra. It gives you kind of a routing layer for your web server. Um, so this is, this is running as a child process in our application supervision tree, and it only runs in the development and test environments, not in production. Um, so any process can send messages to the mock server, and this gives us uh, asynchronous test support as well. So we can um, mint arcs in our test suite um, in an asynchronous way, which is really nice. Um, so you can see here a little bit of the configuration. Uh, at the top here, we have default arc config URL. Is, this is the real easy ID uh, endpoint. But in our development and test environments, the URL is the local host uh, web server that we're running that is responsible for creating arcs uh, in the mock server. So that's how it's configured. It's just like a little, little configuration block. And then the client code that uh, makes the requests, um, this is our arc client. Um, it just calls get and post and put um, in like a nice HTTP wrapper API. Um, so the client will use one URL in one environment and the real URL in the production environment. And you don't have to change anything about the calling code in order to do drastically different things. So we went with a DIY approach, but you don't have to. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, mock libraries out there for Elixir. Um, the Mox is one that came out of that initial blog post that I mentioned uh, on the first slide, um, but there are several others. And the last one I'd like to point out, XBCR is one that we actually use in Authoritex to record uh, ACTP requests for all the different Authoritex modules because there's some pretty complex stuff happening on the HTTP side there that would be really hard to mock. So we record cassettes for those things, just like in Ruby, VCR, same kind of thing. So that's all I had. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brendan. All right, our final lightning talk comes from Chris. Okay, can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. Great. My name is Chris Colvard. I use he, him pronouns, and I work um, at Indian University Libraries on the Avalon Media System project. Um, and my talk today is called Pulling Weeds, Planting Seeds. It's about using pull requests to um, make changes. This is kind of, this talk is meant to just go through an overview of the process of pull requests and kind of demystify anything, because really pull requests are a tool for making changes, of all kinds of things, not just code, and really anyone can do them. So thinking of Simfair as an ecosystem, we can take a look at my garden. This is my backyard garden. It's pretty unruly. Um, there's some parts that are doing pretty well, some parts that aren't doing very well. Um, you can see there's a bed that can not really be seen because it's just been neglected. 
And we have some code like that, right? That um, hasn't been touched in a long time. Maybe the CI builds are failing. Um, you know, dependencies are way out of date and it's just a mess. Um, we've got some beds in the back that are really underutilized. They could use some improvements or maybe like think of code, um, like new features would really benefit it. Or there's the bed in the middle that's our tomatoes and um, it's doing okay. It could use some weeding and um, some pruning. And the tool we have in, in, um, in GitHub to make any of these sorts of changes is a pull request. So GitHub's definition here um, is that a pull request is basically the way to announce to others that you've got a change you'd like to make and, um, and have a conversation around it, um, have review of it, and then eventually merge that change into, um, into the code or into what's version controlled. Um, so to note that in, if you use GitLab, this is called a merge request. So if you're making a contribution and you're getting started, you might kind of make a plan. Um, so you have an idea for a new thing, find a bug. Um, the first thing you can do is make an issue in GitHub and then get feedback on that. Um, GitHub's the place for that conversation, but you can also take that conversation out to other communication channels, especially if you want to draw attention to it and get someone's feedback. Um, so I thought, let's let's try this. Let's do this live. Um, I was digging through some code or some, some documentation. This is a template for uh, a documentation file that would go in a repository. And it hasn't been touched in a few years. And I see that there are these old wiki links that go to the Duraspace wiki, which doesn't exist anymore. So let's start and let's file a ticket. Um, I go to the issues tab, I can click new issue. And this still has my text saved. So I typed in a title, a little bit of con as much context as you can give is, is good. Um, this one doesn't need too much. So I'm gonna make a new issue. And here we have issue number 74. I'm gonna put that, save that for later. And so now we have an issue. We have, you know, kind of like thinking of a plan of, of what changes might be. Now it's time to do the work and make the pull request. So to start, you start by making a branch to work in. Um, if you don't have commit privileges, this could be making a fork of the repository and making a branch there. GitHub's um, user interface makes this easy um, if you want to do that. Um, make your changes and commit them. If this is a code change, then you want to make sure to add tests and documentation as appropriate. Um, you know, check those by running RSpec and RuboCop to check the style. Um, and the key thing is just to make sure that your changes are really like scoped to, um, to the issue that you're working on. Um, if you are working on it and you find other things that are wrong and you really want to fix those, it's best to save those for another pull request and, and just have multiple small ones. Um, if you're doing your code changes and you're running the tests and you have to iterate a lot and make lots of commits, then um, before you submit it as a pull request, it's good to squash those down to logical, um, kind of semantically uh, independent commits that are more compact. Push your changes up to a branch and then open a pull request in GitHub. Um, brief title and as much context as you can add to the description is good. If it's something that's still kind of experimental and so work in progress, just make it as a draft PR and you can get feedback while you're still working on it. So again, let's let's do this. Um, so here's this file. GitHub provides a nice little edit tool. And so I found where in the new wiki this information lies. So I'm going to replace this link and also this one down here. 
try to avoid any typos. Uh, don't need that anchor. And let's update this link label. Um, getting started in the Samvera community. Okay, looks good. Um, scrolling down, this is where the commit, I can make a commit message and say uh, update wiki links to point to new last in hosted wiki. And I'll make sure to make this as a branch and not commit it directly to the main branch, um, which might not even be allowed. So I'm going to click propose changes, and this will make that commit in a new branch. And once GitHub returns, we'll start the process of making the pull request. And let's say this fixes, oops, not this link, but that issue I created. So I'm giving that context of, to point back to the issue I made. And I'm just going to go ahead and make this. And here we go. We've got pull request number 75. And if and then we'll we'll take a look at what kind of the review process is. Once the pull request has been created, it goes through a review process. So um, this, despite you know running checks before you commit and push up. There might still be some issues um, in the code, maybe uh, unintended side effects, some bugs, um, hence the picture of the brood X cicadas that emerged this year. Um, automated checks will run, um, status checks will run on any um, code changes, um, just you know, Rubicop, RSpec, um, Hound for JS Lint, maybe some other checks. It varies per repository. Um, if some, if one of those fails and there's some issue, the submitter should um, fix those. And generally, code review reviewers will see um, all those status checks being green, being passing, and then they'll they'll look for a review. So a reviewer will come along and take a look, um, see if there's a signed contributor license agreement on file, um, check for backwards compatibility if that's important in the PR. Um, you know, ask some questions, suggest improvements. Um, when it's just improvements, code reviewers um, should make sure to not expand the scope of the, you know, of the PR, um, but instead keeping it focused on the changes that are there. So they shouldn't ask for more things to be done outside of it. Um, and so there's a conversation, submitter will respond, reviewer will respond back, and eventually uh, you know, we come to a happy place and the reviewer will approve it. Um, so, and, and if, if you know, a reviewer hasn't come along in a while, reach out. Um, that's kind of a common thing here is throughout all of this, you know, feel free to reach out in any communication channel to get help and get someone to review it. So I'm gonna come back over here check out my pull request and no one's reviewed it yet so i'm going to copy it into slack and say hey could someone please um review this pull request and i hope someone will come along really quickly and review this because it's a real small simple change and hopefully someone will once so i can <laughs> move on um, so the, the next step is once it's approved, really anyone can merge it. Um, and different, um, in different repositories, different, um, I think it's different habits around this. I know in some cases, once it's approved, um, it's kind of maybe left for the submitter to go back and, and merge it in to do the final kind of piece of, of putting it in place. Um, but really, if you see a pull request that's been approved, um, you should feel empowered to go ahead and merge it. Um, it's a separate process for once something's in the code um, to then get it released uh, into a, a gem um, that will 
you know, be usable um, uh, outside of uh, outside of the Git checkout. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. You, this is the, kind of the rough process. Um, okay, some pro tips. Um, you know, feel feel free to make a draft pull request and try to get feedback early. Um, and again, don't hesitate to reach out um, to any anyone um, through any medium there. Um, during the Simvera tech call, we've tried to set aside time to do pull request review. So, um, you know, if you have questions or just want a set of eyes on it, you know, bring it to a tech call. Um, it's been the uh, kind of hopeful policy from the past to have reviewers be from a different Simvera partner institution, um, if possible, for at least for core components, to try to make sure that the knowledge is spread um, across institutions. Um, sometimes status checks, particularly Circle CI, will just fail randomly. Um, and that can be really discouraging. Um, Take a look, see if you can fix it. If not, you know, put a comment in the pull request, um, reach out for help. Um, this often happens with either flaky tests or with dependencies that have been updated and broken stuff out of the blue. Um, it's always good housekeeping to delete off your branch um, after things are merged, unless if you have a, a need to keep it around. Um, and to have pull requests or conversations where it should hopefully be a place for um, the reviewer and the submitter to, to both learn. So you know, trying to underscore that all contributions are welcome and all reviewers are welcome. If you want to review, particularly in a, an approval role, um, you need to have commit privileges on the repository. And there's not really like an exclusive club for this. If you want to ask, reach out and ask um, in like the dev channel on Slack and you can get added to um, the committers team within GitHub. Um, here's um, some very documentation with uh, talking about PRs, but the last link is a, a great blog post that came up um, in discussions in Slack a few years ago about what's good code review culture, what's not good code review culture. I recommend checking that one out. And as I said, everyone, um, yeah, be in touch and um, reach out. We all work on this together. Um, pull requests are a tool for anyone to use documentation or code. Um, and together, we make this stuff better. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. That was incredible to go from an issue to emerge in your lightning talk. Uh, well done. We're just over time. Thank you everyone so much for joining us for the last day of San Vera Connect. Uh, we'll be sending out a, a post-conference survey. We'd love your feedback. Uh, we'll be able to use it uh, even at the virtual connect that we'll have in the spring. So thank you so much. And we'll see.